tips above the water You watch me drown You could have saved me But you let me down yeah. All right, Seth, so yeah. is it true that you were actually there to witness a good portion or the entire Harvey Frizzy yeah. breaking the record of oh, was it 31 hours of, of continual rapping? Yeah, I think Pittsburgh? he went 31 hours and 55 seconds or something like that. He planned on going at least the extra hour for the Permantes and uh-huh. then some. And I actually think because based on my experience and knowledge of uh, marathon performances, right. he was in a zone where he could have, but when everybody was celebrating, he was so happy and filled with the joy that he even said it out loud. He says, man, you guys made me made, made me laugh and smile and cry for all this. I had, and I, He stopped for five seconds and that made it so he couldn't, you know. It couldn't continue, yeah. Right. Yeah. But he, he had it in him. He had it in him. Because that adrenaline, that momentum was going. He was in a zone. He would have been able to do it. It's amazing to me, though, because he, now, did he get breaks every five minutes? Is it, how, how, no. no every, every, every five minute breaks every hour? How did it work? I'll explain exactly? that. Yeah, so, so, well, first of all, I didn't get there until about 12, 15 a.m. that first night. And how he many hours at, would he be in then? So he started at 10, at, at 10 a.m. that morning. Okay. Just because I had a show for a bunch of fire chiefs in town that night. We had a great time. Right, right, right. And, uh, and I showed up in my three-piece suit, and, you know, and, and, and he starts ra- and I walk in, and he starts rapping about how fly I look. <laughs> and I walk in with two lady friends of ours who, who are big supporters who, who wound up taking a lift an hour later back home, but they wanted to make an appearance and he raps about them so that was fun because in my mind not just was this a inst- uh i can't talk straight and i'm that's on radio right. it's terrible and, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the yeah. new media this is pa- radio 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 this is new media this is your show pal. i know right this yeah we can make show. as many, many mistakes as we as we want to including I, me that's fair <laughs> I, I don't care because you know what that, that's the fun and we'll get to this but that's one of the differences between mentalism and magic and we'll talk ah, about right that on, later right on right on but um, now, I've, now I forgot where I went. No, it's all, so, so, yeah, Harvey. So, so, yeah, so, well, yeah, because it's about all about Harvey. It's, it's always you, about Harvey. I think so. He's a, he's a good friend, and I he's love awesome. him dearly. He's awesome. Uh, awesome I don't guy. think about him as Frizzy. I think about him as Harvey. Yeah, because I think all of us do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that, I, I was, when he said he was going to do this, mm-hmm. and it was, um, I think I found out a couple days, about a week or two before it was going to happen, right after we filmed our show, I, that sounded like a mind-boggling amount of time for me. Just this, not, and I like to talk. But I thought about it isn't just talking. Anyone can talk that long, but he had to actually rap. We had to perform. <laughs> perform, and, and, right, and that's where I right, would, what I was right. saying was, this was not just a monumental feat of endurance and mm-hmm. skill mm-hmm. and talent, which it was, uh, where he was setting a Guinness World Record, but it was also a fascinating interactive uh, musical theatrical installation. Because everybody who walk, because it, it was basically a rap installation where yeah. everybody who walks in, yeah. he would interact with them. You could flash words at him. You could pay money to the charity to get him to rap about certain things. You know, yeah. which, which was a great charity, by the way. The music cares, and well, he was known as Freestyle. That was actually I that think was his, his original name. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and he, he obviously because he had the talent to do that. And that must I, my it's mind. It's too generic a name. You can't really trademark well, freestyle. No, it, yeah. Absolutely, but what he did by freestyling for for basically. It was a thirty-one plus hour. That's in, that's crazy. And what I love it's about crazy. this is this shows the great brain behind him. And w- we can remind me later to talk about that because sure. Harvey and I talk about sure. this about associative memory because sure. that's how I, uh, how I do a lot of what I do. Okay, is he? The, if you look up the Guinness records, mm-hmm. it states that you just have to rap, and you can rap covers. You're just not allowed to repeat the same thing, right? Unless it's part of a chorus if you're making a cover. Uh, but you can't repeat that cover again or that song. Okay. He chose not to do that. He chose to do 100% on-the-spot freestyle. And he used that in order to actually rap communications to people and have conversations and all sorts of fun stuff. And it became this beautiful interactive theater exhibit. Right. And in my mind and in my heart, that was one of the most important things. Got because it. at the end of the day... 
he will always have I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records, but maybe some crazy mofo is going to beat him <laughs> one day because that's insane. That's a hell of a, like, I, I, I know performance marathon. Yeah, we were talking yeah, about yeah, that yeah. earlier. Yeah. But 31 hours is tough on anyone to do. And God bless him. Yeah. So, but at the end of the day, he also did this beautiful theatrical installation. Mm hmm. And that's the thing that I'll always remember him for, okay. personally. I mean, okay. I'll remember for lots of things. We're sure. friends, but sure. that's the thing that's most important to me from an artistic standpoint. Okay. I, there's so many areas I want to cover with you tonight. Yeah. and um, we, We'll go six hours. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> we'll I, go yeah. 12 hours. I'm, I'm a marathon performer. I was telling you about that earlier. That was one of the nicknames I got. Or I've been actually nicknamed this multiple times by multiple <laughs> groups because you, you know that I'm a musician as well. Right. Although I don't play as much as yeah. I used to. I found out a lot off camera that I did yeah. not know of you. Yeah, I don't play as much as I used to because magic and mentalism and invent consulting pays the bills. Certainly. So Certainly. Uh, if a skill has to atrophy, I have to, it, it has to be the thing that no matter how much I'm in love with it, mm -hmm. it has to be the thing that doesn't pay my mortgage, right? Absolutely. So uh, instead... Uh, but but I was always known as a marathon performer there where everybody else was going. I was in marching band, mm -hmm. even in high school, mm -hmm. and everybody else is dying in the heat. In that, it, it was just this, We're talking the summer of 95 when El Nino was going through his record high. <laughs> it was hot. Yeah, everybody's dying in the heat. And I was like, yeah, quarter bottle of water, I'm good. Like, while we're going, I'm like, why is everybody stopping? Come on, let's keep going. We, we got to learn these drills. Well, you have a lot of energy, yeah. my friend. Um, well, it's a, it's a mindset, too. Yeah, and, and I want to talk about that. Yeah. So I want to talk first about... about oh, yeah, but the nickname was The Machine, by the way. The Machine. <laughs> yeah, and when I became better known amongst the performers community as a magician and a mentalist right you go on the trade show floor it can be 14 hours with imagine. just a couple of pee breaks oh, yeah. most people can't handle that a lot, even some of my teachers said that they have a contract that says that three and a half hours or whatever their limit is they're done their fingers are toast they can't talk blah 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 whatever their their issue is that's their limit for okay. the night okay and I will go all night if I have to. Got it. it I got, I'll run out of material first got before it. I can keep doing it. You know? Well, what was what was your earliest passion? Was it was it was it magic? What, what as a as a child? It was what? both music okay. and magic. Okay. I, I've basically been obsessed with interactive theater my entire life. Okay. Which is where a lot of things come together. Inspired by who? What? So many different things. Okay. Some of my earliest memories are of uh i had a great uncle lenny levy who played for the pittsburgh pirates mm -hmm. and he was an interesting character too w what he would so he played in the 40s and 50s and part-time in the 60s into the 70s until he retired right on because they didn't get paid what they get paid now no no they didn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> no they didn't but he so he was a he was the catcher in the minors okay but he had an eye for talent he had an eye for coaching, getting the most, getting skill out of people. People right. say, I kind of get that from him. I have a master's in project management. Okay. And uh, it's called a PMP, a bachelor's in information sciences mm -hmm. with focuses in cognitive sciences, music, and computer science. That's okay. kind of there. We, we got the academic credentials out of the way. <laughs> but so. What school? Local here? Yeah. Yeah. I went to Pitt. Okay. Which Pitt coincidentally is actually a top five school for information sciences. It beats out most of the Ivy Leagues. I read that. Yeah. I read that. So, I've always had this talent for bringing the most out of people mm -hmm. and getting people to collaborate. Just kind of like coincidentally, I guess, or not coincidentally, Uncle Lenny did. And but he was interesting. So he was the backup catcher for the Pirates after in the majors. Okay, but he never played a game. But he toured around with them. They kept him on because he had a high for talent. He was a scout. Okay, and he scouted a lot of the great players that while the Pirates trained up and then tra traded to the Yankees and mm -hmm. had great careers in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, he discovered Mazeroski. He was one of his protégés. Uh, he he coached he so he coached the 1960s World Series. Wow. So he coached the game-winning hit with Mazeroski. Full circle there, right? Incredible. And he uh, retired after that and opened uh, Lenny Levy's Chrysler Plymouth Will Play Ball for You, which is where the Aldi is now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Over in um over at uh, on uh, that five way intersection yeah. in uh, yeah. on Nagley Avenue uh -huh. and Roop, you know uh -huh. what we're talking about. Yeah, sure do, sure do. So what that used to be when I was growing up was his Chrysler Plymouth. Okay, 
Okay. I love that quote. We'll play ball with you. You know all the pirates <laughs> bought, their, bought their cars from him. I would imagine so. So he was an interesting character. So he would fly up for the old timers games. Mm-hmm. And I got to sit in the dugout and talk to him. And he would wow. very badly, very badly perform magic. His best trick was pull my <laughs> finger, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a little weak. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he would try to do all sorts of other cool things. Okay. Some of which I actually will occasionally perform in my show with some sure. game used items sure, that he sure, owns. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And so he was one of my inspirations. I, I had a grandfather that I didn't realize that he was cheating, but he used to always deal me gin. <laughs> <laughs> You found out after yeah, a while. Yeah. Uh, my, my dad would do that, that that one that everybody knows with the four jacks escaping. It would drive me crazy. <laughs> uh, I saw Blackstone. Ju- and then I saw like some people on TV. So when I was really little, I saw Blackstone Sr. and Jr. on okay, TV. Okay. I saw weird repeats of a bunch of old magicians from the 50s and onwards. Okay. So, so you were a student of, of original comedy. Oh Origin, yes, yeah. yeah. So, so that. By, by the way, com- comedy is another uh, com- one. Of, well, com- well, actually, comedy, it's funny. We can talk magic, about magic, magic. 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 I should say magicians. Yeah. yeah. So we can talk about comedy all night long too, because I'm not really influenced by these guys anymore. They inspired me when I was little. People like Blackstone and Fantasio and Copperfield and other people like that, uh, and then some lesser known people that you know, Doug Heading is well mm-hmm. known, uh, mm-hmm. but some lesser known people that I saw on TV. Okay. But. You know, I didn't really get to see anything live in person. Like occasional really? magic, the occasional really? magic clown, which is not the same thing. And the kids, <laughs> at like the Harvest Festival. But uh, so, so my parents got me a Blackstone Junior kit. Okay. And I became the kid who did all the kid shows. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. And I don't perform for kids at all anymore, unless it's for a charitable thing. Sure. And. Uh, and even that's pretty rare because what I perform, my what I perform is clean. It's mm-hmm. cleaner than family friendly. It's corporate clean. Any innuendo, corporate clean, right? I, did you love that? I know what that is. Yes, any innuendo that happens is in your mind. I didn't do it. I'm going to look at you scandalously, especially, especially in this PC world we're living in now mm-hmm. for the past 20 years. I imagine corporate clean is even more clean than what yeah. I remember from oh, my yeah. years in corporate. I don't go political. I don't yeah. say anything that could be even slightly bigoted. You know, right? I don't go blue. None right. of that stuff. Okay, because you know, I, I'm basically you know I, I, Jerry Seinfeld, right? Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> And everybody, everybody loves Jerry. If they don't, they're wrong. So, but, yeah, that, that's how I feel as well. Yeah. That's how I feel as well. Well, and it's funny because actually comedy is the third love. Okay. So it's music, comedy. Right on. And, and, that, and so more and more over the years, my mm. influences were not with magicians or mentalists, which is actually a completely different performance art, even yeah. though they get confused. Okay. Well, but, what is the definition then? So. As you believe it to be. Okay, so well, not as believe it to be as it is. Well, <laughs> no, no. Well, <laughs> I'm one of those people. I'm learning. Yeah, and that's okay though. And that's okay, and, and you know what? I and I appreciate that. Like I'll tell you what. I, I'll, I'll tell wish, you a definition of art. And tell because, you you're wrong. You know? <laughs> well, because I wish that was more of how the world run. Yeah. But I've learned from this show that um, unfortunately, at times, facts are very subjective, to depending on who believes them. And mm-hmm. I'm also, you know, and opinions as well, and definitions as well. So that's just me getting uh, more acc- acclimated with the real world. So I'm glad to hear you say that. Well, I that, welcome that. I that, welcome that. And that's a funny thing about definitions. I, I keep f- forgetting. I have to look camera. Or look at you. You know, <laughs> look at me. There's all I'm, kinds. We to, all kinds yeah, of I'm cameras. I'm used to being in all sorts of weird performance right, situations. No, no. So definitions are actually should not and are not a subjective thing. It shouldn't be. Well, that by definition, they're not. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Okay, but even that's been distorted. It, it's kind of like in philosophy where people will use. Uh, what's called do you know what an axiom is mm-hmm. okay so people use an axiom which for the listeners who may not have studied uh, philosophy they may study uh-huh. other things uh-huh. an axiom is a fundamental principle yep. it is a fundamental thing that when you go down to when everything boils down to it you can't define it further so Correct. aristotle defined some of these for example the law of identity or a equals a mm-hmm. so a does not equal c right so this desk is always a desk it's identified as that it's right. never a cat you know <laughs> no matter how much i stroke this desk it's not gonna purr you know <laughs> so 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 oh, even so, though those are in challenge today well they're people these people are just wrong they're, they're yes and, 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 they're, and they're out of their fucking minds well then that's the thing so we have a, a, a unfortunately a dearth of a lack of critical thinking and education in our mm-hmm. system mm-hmm. Uh, which comes from uh people following the dewey way of mm-hmm. the, of uh, of education there's a guy mm-hmm. named dewey who i 
I'm going to alienate like half the people who hire me now. That's okay. <laughs> it's your show, pal. <laughs> this is where my career ends. <laughs> <laughs> On the Eric McGinn project, right. he dies. <laughs> I'm not going to go political, though. But, but I will talk about philosophy and fundamental sure, things. Sure, please do. Please do. So, concepts are tools. Uh -huh. They don't technically exist out in the wild. There's no such thing as a concept. They're mental constructs that allow us in, or in order to identify things, mm -hmm. in order for us to encapsulate uh, different things into, uh, into objects into mental constructs or objects depending on what the concept is so in order for that to be meaningful it has to have a very precise definition mm -hmm. or it doesn't work if this can be a desk and a cat at the same time mm -hmm. in our minds it doesn't work anymore it's got to have that precise definition of whatever a desk technically this would be more of a table i guess but we're using the point because i'm forgetting it goes all the way on mm -hmm. but uh, but but the point is just that it still has that this is still a telephone you know this is still a light bulb mm -hmm. it's none of these are cats right not that i can tell right so if we start blurring those lines and that's actually what happens too is this is a way to control people's thoughts and i actually deal with this as a performer okay. as a mentalist okay where i deal with pe how people cognitively function okay. in order to influence their thoughts their decisions their actions or to get information out of them but i do it in order to demonstrate joy uh basically my, my way of doing things is I, I have kind of a style of irreverent benevolence if you will irreverent benevolence yeah i like it where the world is a beautiful place and the world isn't out to get us uh, now doesn't mean the world can't be hard doesn't mm -hmm. mean there can't be challenge doesn't mean awful things mm -hmm. don't happen but the world isn't set on hurting us. It just Agreed. is. Agreed. So therefore, it's a benevolent place where we have the possibility, the opportunity to make things happen. It sounds like an excellent personal philosophy. Thank you. So with that in mind, I use these ideas to say, no, I'm not going to give you this cognitive dissonance of feeling inadequate. Mm-hmm where I know something you don't know and I'm better than you. I don't feel that way. Instead, I'd rather have you do something cool and have you see the impossibilities in the world and say, this is how we're connected. This is how we can collaborate and work together to make something more beautiful. Or this is how you could do something else or I'm seeing something insightful about you that I think is beautiful. Because I want you to leave feeling re-energized able to accomplish your goals that seemed impossible that if we have this experience and this filled you with elation that maybe your goals are not so impossible so positivity the concept of positivity it, it, as, a, as we know it yeah yeah it, on the less abstract level there's a lot of positivity involved with my performances okay there, there's a, like i said benevolence is really the the best word it's a gift of joy and a gift of re-energization that's what art should be doing for people because Art presents what can be and ought to be. Hmm. So why, are you familiar with the concepts of romanticism versus naturalism? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Great. So I yep. should probably explain for the viewers though. <laughs> Go right ahead. So, but I'm glad you understand because I don't, I don't I do. meet a lot of people who've studied aesthetics. So I'm a little bit of a philosophy nut. Oh yeah. <laughs> I Me don't too. think to the degree that you probably are. But it's uh, it, it's been more than a passing hobby for mm -hmm. me. So, I'll yeah, me too. That. That's for sure. So, when you're dealing with aesthetics, aesthetics is basically the philosophical category that is uh, th that art falls mm -hmm. under. Mm -hmm. There's different w fields of aesthetics, different ways that you can express fundamental ideas. Because whether it's intended or not, all art expresses fundamental viewpoints of life absolutely right it's just that most people who are artists and this isn't the knock against most artists mm -hmm. not even a little bit mm -hmm. so don't think this is a criticism it's just the nature of the beast where they're most many artists are just very sensitive empathic people who've developed a skill for expression and so you hear this a lot of times i don't know what this means but it's beautiful right 
they rely on other people to interpret their art because really what they are is they're a conduit for whatever they're absorbing from society and they're Mm -hmm. expressing whatever Mm -hmm. they in their gut feels meaningful to them or they want to express it's almost a personal reflection would you go as far as to say that that's absolutely accurate and that's a beautiful thing it can be it, well well the the result not necessarily but the concept the, yes the itself. concept isn't that ab- correct yeah. i stand corrected the concept yeah. in in itself yeah. the concept is a beautiful thing exactly yes. so there's very few artists that i meet that actually have studied philosophy that really intellectually think very very hard about everything they do mm-hmm. and what the meaning of those things are mm-hmm. and what they're expressing so i actually have a lot of difficulty talking to artists because that's all i think about you know <laughs> Got it. So, and they don't think about that at all. And in fact, if you start talking to some of some people about that who are very anti-intellectual but excellent mm-hmm. expressionists, basically, mm-hmm. it puts them off because they've never thought about things that way. Well, they also uh, whereas I can't do it the other way. I have to do it intellectually. Understood. And I would imagine we bounce this word around a lot in society today. They, the people will become offended, which is ridiculous. But that's that's something that that's a pushback. Oftentimes yeah. with artists, when you ask for critical thinking, um, outside of that expressive nature that they feel that... that um, and again, every artist is different. I, I, I'm friends with Mia Tarducci, who has mm-hmm. a, a a different way of looking at her art as opposed to a young artist I had in the other day. Which uh, I need to Zach. watch both of those. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I love them both independently, and I, I really respect them both independently, but there is a different philosophical bent i should mm-hmm. say with both of them some of, it might have to do with age or experience too i imagine we can certainly and you probably experienced that as well artists can mature over time mm-hmm. in their thinking not likely <laughs> sometimes <laughs> say, sometimes but, you can teach a do- old dog new tricks <laughs> or people develop or whatever but they still have to but we're talking about foundational level stuff correct so correct. that's the thing is we're talking about things where somebody might mature and they might become slightly more intellectual but they have to have a really serious introspection and mm-hmm. really understand what they're doing on a very fundamental level that i just find that most artists don't yeah not, not most people in general i i think i've been blessed with the three that's been on this show uh, both uh, zach mm-hmm. rudder tom mcgallis and mia uh, all three completely different but also Zachary being the youngest of the three, uh, he, he's a he's a, he was just on the show before we did this one here. He's actually a student of art history, uh, which in and of itself wouldn't necessarily qualify him for thinking outside the artistic norms. But he does have a respect for styles, and I think that there's other attributes of what he's doing that he looks beyond. Um, just the conduit of his expression. He looks beyond that, which I thought was insightful for someone that young. I, I was really... I think that's fantastic. I was, yeah, I was very very impressed I, by that. Because whether I agree or disagree, I try to expose myself and to really study the fundamentals of what mm-hmm. does this form of art, what 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 are the fundamental worldviews that it's trying to express? Right. Yeah. Which is why I consider myself a romanticist. Right, right. So... Right. Uh, so so it, and that gets us back to that topic of uh-huh. we have so many threads we'll have to come back to we, sorry <laughs> okay. Harvey we'll get back to you <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we, so the point is romanticism versus naturalism are the two most diametrically opposed forms of art that you'll experience absolutely in western art forms mm-hmm. uh, it's literally the ba- battle ver- of three, free will versus determinism fundamentally is what they are mm-hmm so and actually there, there was a philosopher um ayn rand who you've, pro- you've probably are familiar rand, with yeah extremely i've I, written I, I figured as a matter of fact from what you were saying a little, a a little like, aside yeah. a little aside um i think her finest work is probably one of her most i believe her finest work is one of her most con- controversial in our society and one of her smallest works and that is the virtue of selfishness absolutely that was a monumental book for me yeah uh, th- it, these are non-fiction books of philosophy of articles that a she lot wrote. of people don't cannot wrap their head around that book i've tried yeah. to have multiple discussions with people on that subject throughout the years and uh because because the fountainhead and, and atlas shrugged are towering novels with philosophy weaved in right but this is straight to the point this and they is, can be is, a little preachy sometimes there's but, no question yeah but i mean you have to look at an author and it's in their entirety yeah. which you not know, agree but, yeah but her nonfiction is fascinating and actually the virtue of selfishness was a fundamentally uh moving book for me it changed my entire world 
Okay. And actually, she wrote a book, whether you agree or disagree with her, because the moment we mentioned this, I've now basically made myself unhirable <laughs> in the entire country. Uh, I don't know why she's so, I don't know why her philosophy is so offensive to a good portion of the world. I don't get that, though. I, I, I just people, don't. I just people don't. who have never even read a word of her have knee jerk negative reactions to her. Yeah, it's because so it's like, you know, if you've read it and you want to discuss it, that's fine. I don't care if you disagree or disagree. Let's just actually have a critical thinking discussion. Let's discuss it on the merits. And you can't do that unless or, or, or you expose yourself. Or the lack thereof, depending on what you want to talk about. Correct. But if you haven't exposed yourself yeah. to the work, then you can't speak. You mm -hmm. can't speak intelligently on it. Right. And that's, and that's but, but again, most of uh, society we live in now are knee-jerk reactions to most things. Yeah. But she's been getting that since she started because she's so diametrically opposed. She... Oh my God! We could talk about Plato versus Aristotle versus <laughs> versus Kant because those are the three main philosophers uh -huh. in Western uh -huh. philosophy, and uh, actually, uh, one of one of her disciples, Leonard Peikoff, wrote an amazing book called The Dim Hypothesis. Have you read that? I've heard of it. I've not read, read it. Read it. It will be amazing. It, interesting. Okay. Uh, so so Peikoff basically talks about those three fundamental philosophers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the and the completely different movements they started. Okay. Every other philosopher in Western philosophy is in one of their camps or a mixture of their camps. Got it. Got and it. he follows society from the first of the philosophers cuz uh, Plato came first. Yeah. He's the heavyweight. Yeah. To me. <laughs> well, he, he and Aristotle, uh, th but he but he talks about he studies the f evolution of society and talks about their philosophical principles based mm -hmm. on those three different things. Mm -hmm. it, it, the dim hypothesis, because I forget what it is. D is st uh, somebody will correct me, but D is, stands for destructive philosophy, which is Kantian philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I stands for integrative philosophy because this ha what these are is it's not like destructive in the world, which might eventually right. be what it is, but right. it has to do with your, we're talking about concepts. This is all tied in. Mm -hmm. it has to do with how your concept integrations happen mm -hmm. and how you view the world conceptually. So, uh, so destructively is is you have destructive concepts. So a lot of th this goes back to what we were talking about was people who are very destructive, even if that's not their intention. That's w the result of it. Right. That's where we get kind of the 1984 double talk, double speak language that mm -hmm. we that that we wind up with, mm -hmm. where you have the conflation of different topic, different words that mean different things. And it makes and what you're doing is you're removing concepts from society, so people can no longer have a dialectic about it. Got it. Which, by the way, this all leads into the kind of theater I perform <laughs> called epic theater, or a.k.a. dialectical theater. So this Got is it. all a progression. Yeah, yeah, So yeah, I love it. I love how we just dived, dove right into I this. I love it. Love and uh, so Aristotle is integrative. So it, it, it's very bounded in reality. Right. And it integrates the con what you f your percepts into concepts. And then those concepts, you can then integrate into higher form concepts etc okay now some people are going to give me some crap about this because i'm being really brief i know it's more complicated people mm -hmm. the people who know uh and pl platonic philosophy the m is mysticism got it He's, because platonic philosophy is that cave of shadows right mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there's these ideal concepts that exist in some separate reality and mm -hmm. then there's all these infinite realities of infinite variations of these right. concepts so we're only seeing imperfect versions of those correct so that mystical version of the perfection mm -hmm. that is um the mysticism yes so that's that other world that's apart from this world yes. so technically every single religion is founded in platonic philosophy no question because it's discussing a and for anybody who's hating on me right now, I'm not saying your religion's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm not to say anything whatsoever. I'm not even expressing my viewpoint. Right. I'm just, just, just I want to qualify, right? Yep. I'm just saying these are what these philosophers said, and this is mm -hmm. the results of their philosophy. Mm -hmm. So the philosopher kings, for example, would be the priests. Right who have to interpret the word of God in the mystical realm. Right. That's one example of that right. in, in practice. That's where those concepts come from. Got it. So I, I don't know if, if I'm making sense or not. No, you are. And, okay. and, and it was funny, too. Um, as a young boy, and this is relevant right now, mm -hmm. uh, I think I saw a comment on social media from you, so you're going to get it. I oh, was go for it. I was exposed to Ayn Rand by a song by Neil, written by Neil Peart by Rush called Anthem. Oh, now you're going to make me cry. 
Yeah, he, we, he, we, he, we he, lost, he, and we lost Neil recently. But but that was my that was my as a young boy and not the greatest uh, student, I might add, in, in my junior high years or grade. Well, the school. song twenty one twelve is his version of the of we, Rand's I learned, novella anthem. I learned that later, but yeah. anthem was really the, it was after the book she wrote. Anthem that was a it, monumental book for me as well because yes. I felt that not, my parents are amazing. I want to qualify this. I have the most amazing, <laughs> supportive parents in the world, and I love them dearly. My right. whole family, my sister is amazing. I love right. them, and they're supportive of me. Sure. So when I'm about to say what I'm about to say, it has nothing to do with them. In fact, quite the opposite. It. I am who I am today because of their love and support. Mm-hmm. My mom was a retired school teacher. She retired when she had me. And she taught me everything that I wasn't learning in school. And that's the thing. We have a very progressive school system here in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. as I alienate more people. And <laughs> We do. Uh, yeah. We do. And so I wasn't learning what I was supposed to be learning. And I felt very stifled. I, I do have a genius level of intelligence. Mm-hmm. And I felt very stifled. In fact, pushed down in school a lot. Okay. Uh, I I would be punished for being bored and wanting to actually learn other things. You know, I learned my multiplication, division, things many years in advance Mm -hmm. because my mom taught me because I was bored. And so reading the book Anthem, when I read it in junior high, like I read that book over and over and over because the only solace I had was when I was at mm-hmm. home with my family who encouraged me and things like that out in the academic world i felt beaten down just like the main character in anthem mm-hmm. where the moment you express any curiosity to learn more than what the only what they teach you mm-hmm. that was it it's a it's a tremendously it's a tremendously it can be a tremendously positive book for a youth to read It'll never be prescribed in public schools, and I don't even think it'll be prescribed in pu- in private in most private schools either, or parochial no, for that matter. They, they've tried but to integrate it the, the Ayn Rand Institute through their um, through, they through, have. Through, through their reading programs they have. But, but, and stuff. And actually, I had teachers who saw me reading her, hers and other serious novels um, outside of the curriculum. It said, you know what, and they gave it to me, and I never did the essays because I said that's to encourage people to read it. I already read it. Mm, <laughs> I'm I good. get it. I get it. Uh, but yeah, to, to to for people listening, I'm going to spoil part of Anthem if they mm, read it. It's all right. But you know, th- this is how I felt. Was for example, this guy goes fr- from a little collectivist communist society, he goes into the sewers in order to escape an experiment, and he mm-hmm. discovers electricity, and he brings it back to the people who are in charge. And if you listen to 2112, this I'm describing a scene that Neil no Peart wrote into 2112. No question. And they literally were using candles. And the people in twenty in twenty one twelve, and the people in in Book Anthem, they said, "No, you can't do this because you'll put all the candle makers out of work and blah, blah, blah and all this awfulness." And Rand grew up during well, the, the priest, the priest of temples well, of Syria, well, squashed, squashed exactly the so, so, founding of the guitar. And for background, like, Rand went through this. People think that won't happen, but Rand was born in russia mm-hmm. it, right before the communist revolution so she lived through she lived through i think it was correct me if i'm wrong i think it was the white revolution was the I, name of that one i think it, I, I i believe that's correct yeah that's so correct. and she lived under the iron curtain before it completely fell and she managed to get out right and not never come back basically uh, yeah. uh which was great but it actually her late real name was elisa rosenbaum I didn't know that. Yeah, that was her real name. Was did Elisa not Rosenbaum. know that. Okay. She. I don't remember where the Ayn came from. A Y N. That's how it's pronounced. That. But Rand came from a Rand typewriter because she wanted to be a writer. I did not. I thought that was her name. No. I did not know that was a fictitious name. Or, no, or, or Elisa Rosenbaum was her name because she faced a lot of bigotry for being born a Jew. Understood. So yeah. she changed her name. Yeah. I, I, I just find it amazing. It's the first time in my life I've had um, in my whether on camera or off camera had such an in depth conversation of Ayn Rand's work, and it's. Um, I never really brought up a mixed company because it's so polarizing. I know. I've just alienated everybody from no, people no, ever no. me again. It's, it, but it's never but the funny part about it is it's never polarizing. It's never polarizing because there are um well read people in the room 
discussing it. It's mm-hmm. polarizing because there's always a knee jerk reaction to this who have not problem. taken the stance of, of understanding or trying to understand. It's it's like mentioning pr- Trump anymore anywhere. Mm-hmm. Even if people agree with you, suddenly everybody's in histrionics. And so yeah, well, we, we, and I don't want to talk yeah. about Trump. By no, the way. We, we, in we fact, don't. that's, that's we a don't. line for me when I, when I'm walking around performing for people. Is uh, I'll hear people talk about Bernie Trump, whatever they're talking yeah, yeah, about, yeah. and I'll say, you know what? This is two hours. We're here to celebrate whatever we're here to celebrate. Absolutely. Some company's achievement, a milestone, mm-hmm. whatever. So just clear your eyes and have a vacation so we can be re-energized. from it yeah. all. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with you, but let's just have two hours to re-energize right. so you right. can go back into that battle And that's wonderful. Later. And what, so that you provide yeah. that salve. And I go right into a mind-reading thing where where their mind is now blanked out with a slate that they're projecting an image onto it, and I have somebody else try to read the image that they're projecting on their yeah, mind, yeah, and yeah, now yeah. we're having a good time. And, mm-hmm. and people are thanking me like, oh my God, that guy wouldn't shut up about Bernie for two hours. We agree <laughs> with him, but we know he wouldn't shut up, you know? <laughs> well... It, 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 the only comment I'll leave with, and I want your opinion of it, mm-hmm. I think for whatever reason, they've coined it identity politics. To me, it's almost, if you break it down, I think Americans continue more and more each year, each election year, each political year, each each with each year of ingestion of, of cable news, we're using our political opinion because i can't even say half the people even have a philosophy if yes the average person on the street do a personal philosophy they don't have a personal oh no philosophy. 90 some percent of people do not have a personal philosophy because having a personal philosophy takes a lot this isn't a knock at people just having a personal philosophy actually takes a lot of time study contemplation and de- yeah contemplation and deliberate decisions and no, cool. understanding no what you're doing yeah we were what you're thinking the, so they so wear their politics people, as a badge now yeah, so it's almost identity identity badge so most people and since we're talking about ranch he had a term called sense of life mm-hmm. which is what most people would think of as their soul right which right. is everything that projects about themselves and i mm-hmm. use that concept of the sense of life with my work when i read people uh but you know, basically reading body language and all sorts of sure, other things. Sure, sure, sure. So what's going on is just people, because they're not intellectual, which most people aren't, yeah. because why would they be mm-hmm. if, they, if they haven't gone to like three Life degrees? Life doesn't really require it anymore. Yeah. The society's been so dumbed down, exactly. it doesn't really require it. Exactly, but they're not. So what, what their philosophy is, whatever they've absorbed from Absolutely. society around them. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the reasons why you see people get real strident about things, where if I say... Now, I like Kiss, don't get me wrong, but if I say, I don't like Kiss, mm-hmm. the band. Mm-hmm. I, doesn't I don't bother like me at all. <laughs> well, I know. But the thing is, so many people, you say, I don't like this movie. Fists are up and dukes yeah, are up, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And what yeah. it is, is because people don't have a deliberate personal philosophy that they really sat down and thought out. Okay. Let's Instead, talk about that for a second, because this, you, I think I think I would love mm-hmm. to hear your thoughts on this before yeah. I forget, because I might, I might forget. I was a, a huge impression made on me as a young man mm-hmm. uh, in my early to mid twenties. Um, I was in business and I just wanted to feel better. And Anthony Robbins had kind of come on the scene at the, in the in the eighties and a little bit over over the top for me. But I found out that he had a mentor named Jim Rohn. You familiar with Jim Rohn? No, that name doesn't ring a bell. He was the uh, he was the entrepreneur and became one of the leading business speakers hired by all the major corporations in the seventies, eighties, nineties, and beyond. And he had a, a bunch of works and a lot of speeches and and very um, uh, no new age, purely like a purely almost like an uncle talking to you. And Jim Rohn built this business speaking empire. Uh, based upon very simple philosophy. And, and what I learned early on was he taught you that you need to have a personal philosophy. If someone was, was to approach you and ask you, what's your personal philosophy? He goes... Well, Rand, hear, remember, Rand wrote people, that book, Philosophy, Who Needs It? Because so many people, they, they don't. eschew ideas because there's so many bad ideas out there that they've been burned before. And so she was one of the people that wrote a book saying, no, you need to study, you need to be Absolutely educated, you need right. to learn how to think critically. It's Absolutely. not. She's like, you know what? It's up to you if you agree with me or somebody else, but Correct. learn to actually think for yourself. Well, yeah, whatever whatever you migrate to or whatever you believe in your soul to be correct, that's not a dispute. The dispute is you need to understand that, and and you will evolve. And, and Roan's thing was you will evolve. You will have people who will come in and, and rock your world or change how you may look at something, but you need to have a foundation. Mm-hmm. And that's whole his whole thing was, I, he his whole thing was, whether I'm, I'm talking to you and you're 20 years old, 30, 50, 50, 60, 
Quit careening from wall to wall as you move through your life. Be grounded, be principled, and understand that you need to have a personal philosophy. And that was a big thing for me because I still was the kind of guy that went out, had a good time, had my cocktails after work, drank. I wasn't a saint, but at the same time, I really kind of had a good understanding of what I believe to be true in this mm -hmm. world. And I tried my best through my career and my life and my parenting my children and relationships to try to keep a center. And I think that's rare and that's not happening anymore because most right. people are not not philosophically based. They don't even know what they actually believe in their core. Does that make any well, sense? Well, because there isn't anything. And I'm not saying people are hollow men and they're empty. What I mean is that what th their, their sense of life and their, and their philosophy is just a hodgepodge of whatever they've absorbed through time because they haven't really thought that through because mm -hmm. they haven't taken the time to read and to study and to, and to learn to critically think. And, Why and, is even, that? and even people who are good critical thinkers haven't mm -hmm. done that. Where we have, so th th this is actually fascinating. Are we lazy? Are we, no, no, as a people, are we there's just. There's a lot of laziness out there, but th this is actually fascinating to me is the history of philosophy in the United States. Okay. Because it's the history of. Um, the humanities and academia in the United States. Right, right, right. So when th this goes back to the foundation of the United States. Okay. When the United States... You got was, me. Let me hear it. Yeah, so... so Because what we're talking about is fascinating, but I want to fill this bit in here. Sure. Because sure, please might, do. Please yeah. do. So what happened when the United States was created, mm -hmm. we got our independence, and I don't call it July 4th, I call it Independence Day, because mm -hmm. that, that annoys me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm particular that way. Uh People are like, you mean July 4th? And I'll say, yeah, Independence Day? Yeah, yeah, what are we doing on Independence Day? And mm -hmm. you, you see them cringe. I'm like, what? It's Independence Day. That's what it's called. Right, right, <laughs> so, right, right. Uh, but anyway, what happened was we wanted to have our own universities. And we wanted to be our own force in every way mm -hmm. in the world, including academia. Mm -hmm. Now... We had all these wonder, th the people who were attracted to come over to the new world, not, this isn't all of them, obviously, but many of them were workers, builders, people who just wanted religious freedom. Mm -hmm. So they weren't the thinkers in the humanities mm -hmm. beyond some of the people in the founding fathers or the people mm -hmm. influenced like John Locke kind of people. Right, right. Uh, you know, e even, even our founding fathers, they were not, they were intellectuals and giants, but they were some not. Some of them. Yeah, I know, but we're talking like Je Jefferson or Franklin, those mm -hmm. kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Franklin is fascinating because he's basically the uh, world's first celebrity, by the way. That's a whole show. That's a whole, that's a whole show. Other subject. That's a whole show that's on a whole its own, show. yeah. We, we yeah. should have like 10 shows together. We may. I think, uh, I think we're starting something yeah. here, friend. And uh, I'm enjoying this. Good. More so than I've been on Good. any other Good. network. Good. Because I get talking freely. <laughs> well, so, no, and, and again, that's the part of this show yeah. is that I want your expression. I want your thoughts. Well, and we, we happen to be aligned in a lot of ways, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, what happened was they said, well, we're lacking in humanities. I know some people who know the history really well are going to say, blah, 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 this or that. I know I'm oversimplifying this. Mm -hmm. But the point is they wanted to have quality humanities, and that didn't really exist. The giants of the humanities existed over in Europe. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those were the people that were proponents of the platonic way of life, which, mm -hmm. pro which was the proponent of everything that was the anti-American. So mm -hmm. American life is basically, an traditionally, is an Aristotelian philosophy. No question. The Renaissance happened the more Aristotle came back mm -hmm. into force mm -hmm. in people's philosophy, and the culminating achievement of that, of the Renaissance, was the founding of the United States, mm -hmm. the only country in the history of the world founded on the principles of freedom and just that. Now, and I love the expression on your face because, see, this yeah, is, you see where we're getting I, here. I get it, yeah. And so the guy, the, the, the giants. World's of, greatest experiments, what it was. Yeah, exactly. And uh, kind of like how, how the, the opposite with the, with the USSR was mm -hmm. another world's greatest experiment. And we all saw how that went. I mean, mm -hmm. how many times do we have to mm -hmm. say, oh, my God, communism is great in concept. We just we just need to do it right this time. Come on. We've tried it every single way. That's how the Roman Empire fell was because they became what we're becoming now, which if they become a welfare state. 
communism and they built roads to nowhere communism but, and its outspurts of, of of socialism have destroyed everything it has touched since the history of its inception well, it's class warfare by the way and that's what we were to to, to tie in another loose end there from our from our conversation mm-hmm. when people are getting upset about things and they, and they talk about things that are not intellectual where they get upset about the groups that they are and being offended on behalf of other people they're mm-hmm. shutting other people up in order to war different classes and there's no together, question there's no rather question. than actually have a real conversation correct. about something correct in order to correct. So you're, you're basically bullying other people into submission mm-hmm. so but but anyway so what happened was they got these guys that were the giants of the platonic intellect basically and brought them to the united states to run all the philosophy and other humanities departments in our schools here. Mm -hmm. So we basically set ourselves up for failure because we wanted to, and they got the giants. They they went and paid any money they could to get the really renowned people because they wanted to have that prestige of having the best universities in the world with their new country. Okay. And everything is kind of from that. If you, if you think about it, yeah, because our youth has slowly been trained by those by, by the platonic philosophy got it got or it. the kantian philosophy because a lot of those guys were kantian which is right. where we get all this destructive stuff right so that's where egalitarian comes from right because right. Th- right. really the only way you know the only way to make me equal to michael jordan is to cut off both of his arms mm-hmm. and he probably still beat me you know by boxing <laughs> his might. yeah <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, so, so you can't, you know, you can't treat things equal that just aren't. Do you? Rowan had a famous statement. It's, it's generally where you're headed. Mm-hmm. I, I think he said that the the liberal thought and the conservative thought uh, need to coexist. He said, for example, he said the Declaration of Independence is the greatest liberal document ever created from this country yet the constitution is the greatest conservative document created by so liberal and conservative are relative terms extremely and are pretty arbitrary as well too well yeah so because if you go to europe Mm -hmm. it's the opposite Mm -hmm. because europe what are you conserving in europe you're conserving monarchy Mm mm-hmm yeah, and so what are you liberating? You're liberating people from monarchy, hopefully to hopefully, freedom yeah. and individualism, yeah, and not and, and not to collectivism. Yeah, or, this guy tried that. Or communism, there, uh, but so so if you go to Europe and talk about liberalism <laughs> and conservatives, so it's people who are actually the the flip of what it's we are flip, here. Yeah, it's flip, right, right, right. But conservatives, what they're so because it's what are you conserving or mm-hmm. what are you supposedly liberating? It's an outdated term, I think, too. For today's society, which they, they, not they're, 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 they're terms that don't make sense. They don't. They, they're not describing they what they actually no, are, they, and they haven't for a while, for yeah. decades. Well, I, I want to talk about philosophy mm-hmm. and fundamental principles. But you lose half the voters as soon as you do that. They don't want to go there. Oh, because you know, but but that's because painful that, thinking. That, that, that's the end of the road, right? That that that's that that's where the politicians are that embody different things, uh, or or claim they are, and they're mm-hmm. in whatever that. I don't want to get into that right, corruption, right, right, but. Right. I'd rather there's a ta- lot of it. Yeah, but so I'd rather talk about fundamentals and philosophy and those concepts. And how many of them even do that anymore at all? Well, almost nobody does. And that's, and that's the point. That's why I talk about those things. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. if you talk about those things, politics comes at the end of the line. Mm-hmm. It should. Well, well, it does. It's just you have to you have to talk about the fundamentals. And if you refuse to talk about the fundamentals, then there's no talking to Got you. Got it. Got it. Because I'm taught... Because I'm going to do a root cause analysis of where where you're coming from when you say that. Ask you a few questions and then zone in on. Well, that means fundamentally you believe this. Yes. So I don't want to talk about that thing. Let's talk about this thing because let's decide whether or not you actually agree. Because sometimes if you talk to them, they go, "No, I don't agree with that," and then you change all everything down the line. You have what you just described very eloquently is basically what I've been stating forever that. If you sat a Republican down and asked him some very black and white kind of questions, and not racial questions, black and white meaning mm-hmm. simply yes or no answers, a, a, a lot of their personal beliefs, if they're being honest with you, will not align with their party. And you can do the same thing with a Democrat. Well, correct. Set them down, that, and they're so. Then you ask them, well, if if these twenty case in point, and these questions might even be part of the platform of the party, and you ask them individually, and they're and. You've answered seven out of ten to disagree with the party you're affiliated, but that whole 
commonality. There's always a trigger, for mm-hmm. lack of a better, terrible word. There's always a root cause why they find allegiance with something, and it's not always lodged in fact. Right. Or well, even belief it, for that it's em- matter. It's emotion. It, it's Speaking of Rand, she call, had a concept that she discussed called the primacy of emotion, mm-hmm. where she discussed how uh, a lot of people, because they don't have that fundamental philosophy, they're guided primarily by their gut, by how they feel about things, mm-hmm. which I'm a very big student of neuroscience and cognitive sciences, and I read more of that than I do magic books or anything like that. Right. And... Technically, we all fundamentally function that way. That's how, that's how our percepts work. That's how our human brain was developed for survival. So thinking is really, really hard mm. in a really logical, rational way. Uh-huh. That's why we have to go to school for five years just to do basic arithmetic. Got it. And we don't think about that anymore because we've been doing basic arithmetic for, um, you're, you're in your 50s, for, you know, another, uh, for, for, for another 40 years. And now it seems easy and you don't realize how fundamentally difficult it is to wrap our mind around it. Mm. P- human beings are good at visual things that have to do with making instant decisions for survival. That's why we're really good with pie charts. And we, that's why we have the fallacy of big numbers where we see big numbers and we're swayed by that, even though it's not meaningful to the decision that we should be making because p- p- human beings are fundamentally bad at statistics. Mm. It's really hard stuff. It's mm-hmm. not what we're good at. Mm-hmm. We're good at making gut reactions. We're good at what's called heuristic decision making. So intuition, that, w- that word intuition, I- intuition and win- wins over logic at times. Intuition is, a des- is one of the words that you can use to describe heur- heuristic decision making. But, but, but that's a technical term. And too many times intuition wins over logic. Would you not agree? Actually, it usually does. So what you really need to do is to fundamentally look at all those and make sure that you've tuned your intuition, your heuristic analysis of the world to be more in line with logic. And we were talking about how Harvey's an amazing branding guy, mm-hmm. by the way. Mm-hmm. And no question. one of the thing and one of the things I do is I study branding. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, a lot of one of the things that I do for a lot of my corporate clients is called emotional brand bonding. Okay. So, when you form a bond with a brand, what th- what's happening is you have some kind of thing where you formed, like I said, a bond with a brand. You have a nice sense of attachment identity to that brand. It could be positive or negative. And when you add the word emotional, now you have that gut, that emotional feeling, that feeling you have in your gut. Right. Uh, there's a fascinating book called Brand Fantasy that discusses brands. B- basically, marketers have for years discussed, tried to attack people based on the rational buy our product because it's better. Right. But people fundamentally are usually making decisions, even if they just narrowed it down to like five different brands out of the thousands out there of okay. the product. They've narrowed that down because you just it's 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 overwhelming the thousands of brands. So mm-hmm. you narrow it down a little bit mm-hmm. based on those gut reactions, based on those brand fantasies. And then maybe you make a rational decision or maybe you don't. Or maybe you think you do and you're just justifying your 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 your, your gut decision which actually is we've discovered as studying neuroscience is more and more the case. Okay. Which is why I talk about tuning those so that way your, your, your gut decisions are more and more rational. Okay. So what a brand, so what a brand fantasy basically is, is this is all of the unconscious associations you feel with a brand. So for example, there's a study that showed that if you show pictures of pe- pictures of dogs to people, Mm -hmm. they are more likely to buy Puma brand shoes than another brand of shoe because of the unconscious association where your mind, most people's mind instantly goes dog, cat. They're looking at shoes. They see the word Puma. They've been thinking about cats. They're thinking good about animals and dogs. Yeah, that's a cool word too. (laughs) Yeah, right? Well, that's the thing. And they're going for the cool factor. I I, I wear Pumas. I love them, but I, you know, Part of it is the cool, cool thing, and it's part of it's because I have weird feet, and they're one of the few. The fit well. The yeah, fit well, right, but yeah. you know, there's a bunch of different brands that fit well. So why did I choose them? Interesting. Over the other brands that don't. fit Is that well? under the phrase of subliminal? Is it is it a yes subliminal or n- sort decision? Of, sort of. Yeah, yes and no. It, subliminal is kind of bullshit. Okay. It, it doesn't really work that way. Okay. You can't flash things and make people buy stuff. And the I always studies, wondered about that. And, the stu- and by the way, because I studied this stuff when I went to school, uh, so I studied those studies. 
those studies were actually faked studies in order to, they, they, no they shit. Were, yeah no they they were they were intentionally fake studies that people cl- that that these academics claim they did in order to jump start a discussion about subliminal messaging interesting so subliminal messaging can work but just not in the way that most people think about it in that silly science fantasy kind of a way okay where they where where you insert like the word and phrase in frames where you never even see it that doesn't work let me take you back to my original question for you um definition of a magician definition of a mentalist okay so the, the so basically magic and mentalism are are maybe the two youngest forms of performance art okay and so they're, they're fundamentally different things but they can overlap and some of their methods sometimes overlap there's weirdness all right which and, and a lot of people perform both like i perform both and i consider myself more of a renaissance man kind of a person where i perform a variety of different theatrical things but i okay. have to put some labels on it so okay. people no, can no, hire me fair enough fair enough because like i get hired for events to perform and i and i give talks mm-hmm. where i give talks on um on change management and on collaboration and uh, effective reading techniques that help you with sales or interpersonal interactions like we were talking about before we turn on the cameras right, uh, right. about about uh, root cause analysis to basically mm-hmm. come up with uh, fundamental drives of people and motivators so you don't take advantage of them but what you do is you use that knowledge to be able to collaborate to create a win-win situation where this is the goal that we have to do this is what drives you. This is what drives me. We both have to get here, but we're fighting. Got it. So instead, let's figure out a way to make both of our drives collaborate. Understood. To make that. Understood. And I have a whole system that I'm writing a book on called Owning Change, which is a whole new approach to change management okay. and reframing change. But And I get hired a lot for like hospitality suites and conferences and sure. things like that where uh, where I take the what we're talking about, this emotional brand bonding in advance and discuss it with them and come up with ways for for people to form emotional connections. Got it. So if you craft an impossible keepsake Mm -hmm. that I've, it is not just the keepsake having the brand on it. That's just, that's a mnemonic. That's a memory aid for the experience I gave you. That's basically soft selling subconsciously your brand and creating these emotional responses with it. Okay. And you take that home. And you keep that. You put it up on your wall. Actually, ask Harvey about what's hanging on his office wall right now. He came out to one of my secret speakeasies, and I did something cool for him. And but I there there are people around the country that have things where I've been run down in Pike Place Market in Seattle by somebody that moved from Pittsburgh to Seattle that that still had something with a with a company's brand on it, my name on it, and it was like I still have this in my wallet and I show it to everybody and I talk <laughs> about awesome. the company and I talk about you and that's gotta be rewarding. It's really rewarding. And we're talking like ten years later I still having right the wallet. Right on. You know, there's couples where I where, where I've done something beautiful for the couple where they mm-hmm. craft an impossible mm-hmm. romantic keepsake with the power of their love, proving that if the two of them can do this impossible thing, mm-hmm. they can overcome anything and i've had couples literally send me pictures 15 years later of they had a fight and there was some shoving (laughs) and the thing that in that thing that was on their mantelpiece fell and they picked it up and they all this went came washing back and they sent me a picture and said thank you so much for helping us through this hard time wow so that's that's rewarding that's really why i do this is to spread joy and bring joy i retired from project management and i do this but i know also what that that helping people sell and things pays bills but i do that through spreading that joy got it uh that that's why uh, you may have noticed my 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 trademark slogan Mm -hmm. is um because everybody else just takes them to dinner. Mm-hmm. What do you do in a time when you need to distinguish yourself? And everybody buys somebody dinner. Right. That's nice, but right. you give them an experience, a memory they'll cherish forever. Right, right. So that brings us to that question, which is, uh, from a theatrical standpoint, uh, magic and mentalism. So magic is basically uh, using whatever methods you use to make something impossible happen that... Uh, basically gives people with an emotional feeling of astonishment. All right. And it's basically a special effect. We know that. And we know, okay, we, we can get real deep and I'll say magic isn't real in the real world, but technically in the constructs of our mind is where it happens and it's real from that perspective. 
so that, that basically it's kind of the art of astonishment if you will in fact the there's art a, of astonishment yeah and actually there's a well-known within magic circles magician who wrote a series of books with all of his material called the art of astonishment the okay th three or four volumes they're okay. wonderful books uh just describing effects and I, I don't like the word tricks tricks are what ladies on the vegas strip do right uh, I perform pieces of uh, of performance art that mix all sorts of things together. Okay. And what what you would refer to as a trick, I would refer to as a routine or an mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. uh, the fundamental things that I haven't turned into a full performance piece yet. Sure. And mentalism is a performance art that you're performing in a way that's basically demonstrating superior mental ability. Okay. Which is open to a lot of interpretation, obviously. Or it the is TV show called The Mentalist. That's where... <laughs> yeah, actually, there's a guy named John Stetson, who's one of the best mentalists in the world, and uh, and I study him. That this, this show's based off of it's a real, based on real his person. Life. It's okay. based on his life. Did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so, so I, and I've studied with, and I've studied with a bunch of people who were involved with that show and who were involved with a bunch of other shows that were my friends, you know? Okay. Um, a lot of the TV shows you see for magicians like um, like uh, like David Blaine's and mm -hmm. um, Chris mm -hmm. Angel's and those, they had a team of well-known within the industry magicians okay. that helped write and develop everything. Right. Uh, actually, there's a guy who's well-known locally. He's not from here, but he lived here for a while. His name is Banachek. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of him. A bunch of people listening will probably have heard of him. Okay. One of the best mentalists also. Uh, he worked on that show. Uh, there's a friend of mine, David Regal, who's an amazing magician, okay. uh, who worked on that show, and you know we talk about that stuff all the time. He's also a great writer, and he wrote for like Rugrats and stuff like oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah. And I love every now and then he posts a picture of his residuals check for the year <laughs> for Rugrats, and it's like three cents. <laughs> so unless you have a really good residuals contract, people who say you'll make a lot of money on residuals, yeah, uh -uh. <laughs> yeah, it's a different animal too. I mean, Hollywood and, and yeah, just like the Brady Bunch make no money on residuals because yeah. there's contract was a known residual contract Incredible. but like the characters from seinfeld they make tons on residuals because they had a high residual contract mm -hmm. so it just mm -hmm. depends on what you get yeah and then you turn and, and who's representing you and mm -hmm. what that uh, production house is willing to do and what era it happened in yeah also you know the actors who are seen as the stars and seen as the faces of things get mm -hmm. paid more than the writers who are seen sometimes mm -hmm. as replaceable even if we know that that writer is the only one that'll make the show mm -hmm. successful they're not the public eye money maker you, you admire jerry seinfeld though right? oh I, yeah i admire yeah. a lot of comedians but i admire him uh, what, like, what about seinfeld just really resonates with you i admire so many things uh the biggest thing is just how his mind works uh i mean i think he's hilarious mm -hmm. and i love the construction of every single one of his jokes he analyzes and you can tell this and i found out afterwards but i could tell it before that he analyzes every syllable to mm -hmm. make sure that it's the maximum impact mm -hmm. and i'm a very verbose guy i have a propensity for verbiosity <laughs> so i tr and, and i can't help it so i love that he's so good at that because i spend a lot of time analyzing the construction of things and he's a very intellectual comedian okay and he thinks about the construction of what he does extremely detailed process uh, i feel like me and him can hang in a certain sense because we would just talk if he feels if he feels like talking shop you know we could talk about that kind of all stuff. the nuances yeah because i spent tons of time growing up studying every comedian every comedy author uh every comedy film producer i, I take influences from diversity in fact i take very few influences from the magic world interesting that's very and the, interesting and, and if you like if you said who, who are the magicians that influence you most i'll, I'll give you weird answers got it. i'll give you people who you wouldn't realize were are actually great magicians got it who have been big influences on me so people like cary grant and woody allen or paul mccartney is a really good magician <laughs> didn't know that yeah uh you know so people like that mm -hmm. are big influences on me and uh you know, but you took you took a lot from famous comedians is that right oh big time like and, who are your favorites uh well oh, mel who'd you, brooks who's you mel, the from? mel brooks and carl reiner are huge for me i've listened to every 2000 year i can i could start reciting 2000 year old man right now okay yeah okay uh but obviously his movies too uh because i study everything that these people do uh actually arsenio hall started out as a magician I did not know he, that. And he was he he was like the uh, did not know that he started out basically as a a very skilled actually uh, 
copycat, so to speak, of the style of uh, Lance Burton. Okay. With the doves flying everywhere. Okay. And, you know, and that was his act. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Did not know that. Uh, so, so actually speaking of Eddie Murphy, but, yeah. uh, but I go old school. So I go back to the vaudeville days. So I love the Marx brothers and I love anytime I can find anything. That's even a snippet of anything they used to do on stage on Broadway. I obsess over that because their okay. movies are pale in comparison right. to what they really did. Okay. Uh, so obviously Gracie and Burns, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Milton Berle, all the, all those, all the great old vaudeville Uncle guys. Milty. Yeah. I love all of those. And I listened to those so much growing up and obsessed over them. And I also That's really goes back a ways. Yeah. And I also obsessed over the counterculture guys from the sixties and seventies. Lenny and Bruce. Have, yeah, that was the first one that was going to come out. Lenny Bruce. I have, I could start reciting live at Carnegie <laughs> hall for you right now. Even, even, even all of his, uh, in fact, every time I, I don't even try to stop myself every time. Nobody gets it but me. But every time a uh, a microphone squeals feedback, <laughs> and I'm like walking around, and I have a, I go, oh, bats, bats in the belfry, like just can't, just press on that up, so you know. So, uh, but actually, Woody Allen had had an amazing series of uh, of, of comedy albums, stand up albums. Mm-hmm. That material was amazing. That he actually developed into the jokes that you see in his movies right, later. Right, right. And right. I love those. And in fact, sometimes when I just find myself having to do stand up comedy on stage and my mind draws a blank, I'll just start reciting. Go right to like, it. Like the story of him <laughs> down south, uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it, during Halloween and putting a sheet on over his head, you know. <laughs> Got it. You know, I'll just find myself doing that. You know, if, if 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 I draw a blank all of a sudden, and I'm and I'm on like a comedy op- mic sure. kind of a situation, which happens less and less over the years. <laughs> uh, or uh, David Steinberg, I love David. Uh-huh. Steinberg. I know that like you were like, who the hell comes on here? It's awesome. You had Terry Ward on great. here, and I love Terry. And Terry, by the way, you if you're watching this, you promised we were going to have lunch soon. You hear that, Terry? Yeah. Huh? You hear that? Yeah. And uh, you better reach out. Because we were going to talk about Dante. I'm going to be your next guest that talks about the Divine Comedy, but from oh, a different Dante, perspective. Dante's Inferno. Yeah. Yeah. He, that'll get me to the, when we start talking about epic theater, which is what I really do. Got it. Got it. Uh, got but it. yeah, David Steinberg's a huge influence. Okay. I, could, I could recite Disguise as a Normal Person by heart right now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, like, the, like modern comics, I don't pay attention to. So, like, Carlin and didn't do anything for you. Um, I like Carlin. And Carlin's a genius, and I studied Carlin, mm-hmm. but he's not one of my absolute favorites. Uh, actually, uh, it could, because he's so polarized right now, because he's an awful human being. Was he? Carlin was an awful... No, no, no. no Bill Cosby. Oh, Cosby, Cosby. And actually, my dad is a big comedy guy, and yeah. my dad loved Bill Cosby. Yeah, I did. Growing up, I did. That was just funny. He, he didn't need vulgarity to make you laugh. No. Although he did sometimes. Like, he had that, he had, he had that bit about, you know on the album where he talked where he mostly talked th- thematically because terry was saying why don't people do theme albums cosby did some theme yeah albums. he did and he did the theme album about uh the growing pains of his kids going through puberty basically and oh like, i remember that yeah the, so, so that was about as dirty as he got yeah, where he talked yeah. about like t- introducing his kids to condoms and yeah, making sure that he's wearing it everywhere he goes that's like <laughs> not now but he's wearing it i was like that's so weird i just remember being a kid just in, in the whole yeah. bit about noah and mm-hmm. god i mean that was like this is God, right? <laughs> <laughs> David Steinberg's thing about uh, about this is God is even better. But <laughs> okay, well, even Red Fox, which was yeah, uh, oh, was, Red Fox is great. But, but as a kid, uh, we weren't real. We had, we had to sneak mm-hmm. that stuff. Uh, him, him and Richard Pryor, we had to sneak that. We only knew Pryor pretty much from the movies that came out because then yeah. you're like, you know, Dad, he's got like the stand up routine, and I was like, Yeah, you shouldn't be listening. To <laughs> yeah, I, st- I so I stopped paying attention to comedians around the. The, the new comedians around the, I want to say, early nineties or okay. so. Um, I so I, Sinbad didn't do it for you. <laughs> I, he, I didn't enjoy his his material, uh, but 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 I was still involved in the counterculture. Sure, like, like that's that's what attracted me. That sure. was that kind of that that irreverence in yeah. streak in me. Yeah. So that was kind of the last streak of comedians I paid attention to. I don't like Andrew Dice Clay. Uh-huh. I, uh, I never I, I th- got him either. I, and actually, I love this. There's a story. Uh, of uh, Don Rickles, who I love, love Don Rickles too. And by the way, this is a problem. There's a Don Rickles syndrome in this country, in this world. 
so, so many people, people to think, get them now. No, no, no. So many people think they're Don Rickles and they're not. Oh. And I actually oh, have oh. this problem as a performer where people assume they say, "Oh, don't pick me. Don't mess with me." I said, "I don't mess with anybody. I get up and I make you look good. If right. it, if it work, you know, I'm going to do something where you're going to do something awesome and look great in front of everybody. I'll do all the work. Don't worry about it." you'll look good got it if it works it. you'll get all the applause if it doesn't work i get all the blame same re- same relationship Nothing i've had with lose. every girl Nothing. i've ever dated <laughs> yeah. I, I go back and i look at uh, the johnny carson show for me oh my god i love for that. me is bob for, newhart i love bob newhart yeah that very dry humor is just i love that dry humor yeah. but i but i i and like, i have that i have that deadpan dry humor where people like like it takes them five minutes to go oh my god that was fucking hilarious <laughs> because I, I thought he i thought he was serious there <laughs> I like watching Rodney Dangerfield. Oh yeah, early early Rodney. I used on, to memorize all of his things, all his one lines. Early Rodney on Carson, mm-hmm. but Don the Don Rickles appearances on Carson were just incredible to me. They just were. Yeah. I mean, uh, he. Um, and I, I remember early '90s. He opened for Sinatra as Sinatra was on his uh, oh, do, yeah. last leg. Oh, was, do, do you know the story of how Don Rickles and Sinatra got together? No, not at all. So my friend. Uh, David Veneros, shout out to you, was the uh, keyboardist and backing vocalist for Tony Bennett okay. for years. Okay. And he's one of my best friends in the world. Not Tony. I've never met Tony, although David was very nice and got me seats to see Tony last time he came through town because Tony gives him seats. Um, but David's a good one of my best friends. Okay. And he told me the story about how Don Rickles and Sinatra became inseparable. Okay. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Okay. Total tangent here. So, Rickles had opened for Sinatra once, like, a couple years in the past. Okay. And he's at some place in Vegas. I forget the name. It's a famous place, but it doesn't matter. Harris, uh, probably. No, it wasn't there. <laughs> so, no, I mean, in the restaurant. But he sees Sinatra there, and he's on a date with a girl. And he wants to impress the girl, and he's like, oh, oh, I know Sinatra. I opened for him. We're good friends. And he goes over, and he, you know, he's this tiny little guy. The bodyguards are towering over him, and he manages to get a couple words. Sinatra's like, yeah, I'll let the like, little guy in. <laughs> and, 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 he go, and, 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 and Don Rickles does it in, in that obsequious way, obsequious way he does things sometimes. Uh-huh. He says, oh, Mr. Sinatra, I'm, please, I'm a big fan. So I don't, I don't, do you remember me? I opened for you a couple years ago. And he pretends he knew him, but... Rickles could tell he didn't. He says, look, I'm with this girl here. It would, it would mean the world to me if you could come by and just shake my hands or pretend like you remembered me and we're pals. Because I'm really trying to get with this girl. I'm really trying to impress her. Uh-huh. And please, it would just mean the world for me. And Sinatra usually said no to that kind of stuff, but he decided to do it. So Sinatra waits till you know they're done with dinner and he's deciding to leave. And he goes over and he, he just stops and says... Oh, hey, Don! Really great working with you the other the other night. I love working with you. You know this guy; he's real funny. And Don just stops and looks at him. And says, Frank, what the hell, man? I'm on a date here. What are you doing? Interrupting me on my oh my god! He does this to me all the time. I can't get away from this guy. And you know, and, for, and, and Sinatra, you know, was a bit of a mafia kind of guy, right? And, and, and Don is just complaining about him in this histrionic way. That is great. And, and Sinatra dies apparently. Like, like he he doubles over with laughter, has to have, like sit down. He's laughing so hard, and they became instant best friends. Oh yeah, I mean that was it was, and, and I I felt like I was kind of robbed of an era. Um, I was born a little too late because I really, mm-hmm. um, ben, uh, Sammy Davis Bennett and Sinatra. It, came my great uncle Lenny ran with the Rat Pack, by the way. Wow, and he was good friends with Sammy. Since wow, Sammy Davis. They came in the eighties. And, we have uh, all sorts of pictures of them together. That's so cool. Yeah. I remember I took my grandmother to see the Pacific Arena, and apparently... He, he's, he does walk-bys in a bunch of the th- things. They would sit by the pole, wow. and they would grab whoever's by the pole to just be like the extras walking in their movies. How cool is that? Yeah. My, uh, by the way, you can see Uncle Lenny in Field of Dreams very prominently a bunch of times, because oh, that's, that's cool. all the Pittsburgh Pirates from that team. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, original yeah, 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 right. I remember just going to a show, and, and, and Frank was sick, I think. And it was just Tony. So, so I'm trying to think how it was. It was Tony. Uh, it was probably 87 or 88. Was, so Frank was sick. It was Bennett. Frank's. Uh, oh, it it was Bennett. Uh, Sammy Davis and I think they brought Rickles on mm-hmm. to, to open the show from a comedic standpoint, which oh, yeah. was, um, which was that, amazing. Which is speak, amazing. And by the way, just reminded me, I, I, I'm a big fan of Gilbert Gottfried. Okay. Even though I'm, he's as he's as dirty as I am clean, right? Yeah. But, uh, 
Gilbert Gottfried... He's an acquired taste for me. He is, but what he is... This is what I love about him, is he's one of the best comedy improvisers you have ever seen. Interesting. And I do a lot of associative improvisation in my show, so I have set pieces where I plan to do things. Sure. I'll perform a question and answer session, right, which right, right. is basically me re divining thoughts in people's minds. Okay. And uh, questions, t serious questions. And th this was serious things where, okay. you know, it's not a comedy show kind of a thing. Okay. Where... I'm giving, and I give people meaningful answers, and that's basically a big improvisatory session with an audience. Interesting. And I actually have a show called Think a Drink that uh, that 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 I do that, and I tell people to associate alcohols and drinks with them, and whatever they're thinking of, I produce from nowhere. <laughs> so that, it's a it's a it's a very fun one. Okay. Show, but uh, so so I love Gilbert Gottfried for that reason. Okay. Okay. But uh, you know, I'm thirsty anyway. Oh, um, crown! I, I should share. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, you want some back, or I get to run this? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I'm good. I, I'll, I'll release the kraken. <laughs> mm. Nice and sweet. Wow! I can keep this or what? Yeah. I want the shot glass back, or I'll have to buy another one. But yeah, I, I just this guy pulled a, pulled a shot of crown out of his pocket. Everybody That's should a, have. I gotta learn. I got that. I have to learn how to do. <laughs> Everybody should have an emergency shot of liquor in their pocket. I, I, did, I, I was a one of the ways that I made a little bit of extra cash in college was I worked at Saz for Sazerac Moonlighting. Okay, and I was down at the South Side and I promoted Fireball Whiskey. Oh, okay, so I was the Fireball That's Whiskey not a bad magician. Gig. That's right. Not a, that's not a bad yeah. gig. And then I would just walk around be like, "You want some crown? You want some crown? You want some crown?" <laughs> oh, <laughs> not crown. My sorry, Fireball. <laughs> yeah. I'm a sipper. I am not, but that is darn good. This is cracking. Want some cracking? No, I'm good. I just like that. That was great timing. The cracking. Oh, thank you. That was great timing, by the way. Oh, thank you. That's, see, what they, that's what they pay me for. I didn't see that coming. That's what they pay me for, the timing. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the yeah. speak. But, um, oh, and, uh, yeah, and, and by the way, just to finish this thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Show. Do you remember Mr. Show? Mr. Show. Bob Odenkirk and David Cross's HBO show. Where uh, wait, was Tom the, Kenny and is that before Jack Black and a Saul, bunch of, that was before the uh, it was ninety or early nineties. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Jack Black and Tom Kenny and all those people like that. I think I do. Got their start I on that. I think I do. It's big influence on me. Okay. Uh, that okay. kind of alternative comedy. That's that progression. The kids in the hall are huge. Oh, huge, I love that. Yeah. It, it was funny because a lot of people in my sphere didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I, I have an affinity toward Canadians. I don't know why. I, I have family up there. I just there's some Canadian blood in me. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I get it, too. That's, so th there's so much fun. And I got to spend... So I'm a humongous Frank Zappa fan. Okay. And Dave Foley is a humongous Frank Zappa fan. Okay. But the Didn't thing, know that. And, and we both love his entire ooh, but the things we love are like the most are on the opposite side. So um, He was too smart for rock and roll. Yeah. He you was. Know. He and was. I, I take, he a, was. I take enor speaking of influence, take enormous influence from him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm listening to Todd Rundgren on the way in here, uh -huh. but we were talking. I listened to you know. I, I studied guitar craft with King with yeah, Robert Fripp and King that Crimson. Little bit. That was a, that uh, I, I listened I to literally, literally dropped Bootsy almost. Collins is a spiritual hero of mine. So I, I, I listened to Fella Cudi, you know, wow. but I listen to modern composition as well. I do serial compositions. <sighs> That's all. It's all over the board there. Yeah, uh, I made so, guitars for Bootsy, bass guitars. Oh, for Bootsy I, I heard you Wasp talking to Terry about that. Yeah. Yeah, what a guy. I only was in his presence a couple of times, and man, he was cool. Cool. Oh. Cool as a cucumber. Oh, I got to see him in and concert a, a couple of times. appreciative so guy. Oh, good. Yeah, appreciative guy. And uh, I used to follow King Crimson around. Actually, I have a little bit of hearing loss in my left ear because the tour that Crimson did when they um, were with uh, John Paul Jones mm -hmm. for Zuma. He, he did the two oh, what a talent there, huh? Yeah, where he did two albums, Zuma and the Thunder Thieves. Well, I saw the Pittsburgh show. So what I did was each of the two times that he came for each album, mm -hmm. I saw them here and I went to the and saw them at the uh, what was it the 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 Odeon, the Orion. What's the place that's no longer there in Cleveland? I used to see oh, a lot of shows there. Oh yes, yes, yes. The Orion's in Baltimore, so it must no, be the uh, Odeon. Odeon. The Odeon, Odeon yeah. The Odeon, because I used to do a lot of shows in the uh, in the Rhine in Baltimore. When I used to promote shows here in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. we would usually bring acts in and then they would go to the Rhine in Baltimore got and it. vice versa. Got it, got it, got and it. And so so I went and saw them here and then went to saw them again in Cleveland the next night. That was very cool. And when they were doing the tour with Crimson, oh my God. 
But so back when the rosebud still existed, oh, I loved. It I there. stood too close to a speaker stack. It's all called during, concrete and steel yeah, in there. Yeah, that's I know. why. That's why you had the hearing problem. I know. So no, no, I was literally stood right next to the speaker stack on the left side and the one time I forgot my earplugs because yeah. I'm big on that uh, me too I used to uh, be and now I have a little bit of pain and some uh, well actually the pain's from a car crash where I have a pinched nerve but uh, but I have a little bit of hearing loss in we're there kindred now. spirits my friend yeah I have from, from, uh, from, from John Paul Jones and uh -huh. Nick Pegg uh, uh -huh. we never got to talk but I, his expressions was hilarious because each of those four shows I was the reason why I want to learn to guitar was because I wanted to learn how to play um war guitar or the stick because i wanted to be able to attach a different midi instrument to every single instrument in my own orchestra got it so i was learning how to do it and I apparently and i was nailing like everything nick was di playing really like the air, air stick playing not air guitar air stick playing <laughs> that's how nerdy i am and and then i started playing wind midi controller and which did everything i wanted to but you and know for those um, who don't know what what you're referring to tony levin is that right? Tony Levin's one of the best ones. Is, as he well. plays an instrument called the stick, which is the Chapman stick, because Chapman, like Graham Chapman, but technically yeah, yes, but is, is the guy correct. who invented it. But, but it's it looks like, like a it, two by four with strings. Yeah, and, and it, like an, almost like an upright. I don't know if you want to consider it like a, an element of upright bass. There's, no, there's no, no, no the, frets. So, there's no. It, it's just so it, it's it's fretless. So the the tension on the strings are arranged differently than they are correct. on normal guitars or other string instruments, correct. violins, etc. So normally with most instruments, like a guitar, where you have to fret the note, the, mm -hmm. the note, mm -hmm. and then you pluck it in order to make the sound happen. But technically, if you tap it, you get a little bit of a sound, but mm -hmm. it's not prominent. They've rearranged the tension on this big stick so you don't have to strum it anymore. Right. You just fret it, which now frees up your other hand to fret things so you can play bo multiple parts, one with each hand. So a really great g guy like Nick Beggs, who was touring with Jonesy, what he would he was the guy from Kajagoogoo. What, I remember that. Yeah. you got to be kidding me. And I'm, I'm obscure reference now. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so what, what he would do is he would play the bass part and the lead part at the exact same time right. while Jonesy went over and played keyboard. Yeah, which made that tour just amazing. The versions oh of God. Zeppelin, the songs the, they the, play were I can still hear off. when the levee breaks right now. I know. So and good. And that's why I was so impressed with it the trampled entire underfoot, thing. that's my favorite. That, that and Levy, levee are my two favorite Zeppelin songs. Keely's oh Last God. Stand for me is pretty... Oh, I love that one. Yeah, that's good. A lot I of just, bands wouldn't have existed. Iron Maiden and some of these bands mm -hmm. that came later would not have existed if it wasn't for that song. That oh, song, I think, changed the landscape of what mm -hmm. hard rock and metal became after yeah. Zeppelin. That's just my little side. But uh, the stick was always fascinating mm -hmm. to me. And anything that's fretless in the, in the fretted instrument world, the level of precision has to be so good yes and that semitone left or right as you roll your finger matters maybe not to the average ear but to most musical aficionados and uh, people that really love music there's no room for air on those instruments and the precision is a whole nother mm -hmm. skill set which even your legendary guitar players don't have yeah you know you take the precision away from clapton and page on a, on a fingerboard you take that precision away they're not the same and they're not the same guitar player yeah i've always waited for t for, for steve hackett to pick up the stick because he he's a he's a he's a tapper too. i get it yeah i get it I which get i it. have an interesting relationship with steve hackett okay so actually this leads it to because you were about to ask about secret speakeasies yeah, yeah, which, yeah. That, how do you know that but the mentalist you, in him. That's no, exactly no, I, that's I, I where I was take, going. I, I can't take credit for that because you started to ask the question. <laughs> right I have heard it. And right I when you whipped out yeah. the, the booze. That's what I'm saying. My, but, so I, this, but I didn't articulate that. Well, but I don't, well, this is what we talk about, what we were talking about early in the conversation where you can reframe things and you can um, subtly influence conversations and people's decision making through all these subtle things and to, and to change phrases and wordings to lead th people to think things or not think things. Okay. But. Okay. Uh, so, so, so that's kind of what I. A little weirded out right know, now. That's like what I do on stage. <laughs> so. A little weirded out right now. Well, it's directing a conversation, right? Because I'm tangent man, big time. Like we still haven't finished talking about, uh, harvey's marathon well, that's fine well yeah we'll circle back around yeah which i stayed up with him i went because I, I knew that as a, as a marathon performer myself i was telling you i, I had the nickname of the machine as a as a not just as what i do now but as a as a, as a instrumentalist as well mm -hmm. and uh i knew that he had everything he needed like right. he had great 
medical staff. His team was amazing. His girlfriend's amazing woman. Love mm-hmm. her. They, yep. they had everything under control. But one thing that was missing was having somebody for solidarity that was a performer that knows what it's like to push those limits. Yeah, the marathon of it. Yeah, the marathon. And uh, I've been told by a lot of people, a lot of coaches, uh, I've been dating a girl who actually qualified for the Olympic medal for marathons, or the Olympic team for the U.S. for marathon twice. And her grandfather won multiple Olympic medals and raced in the same Olympics with Jesse Owens. Wow. And uh, she got trained by him. So we talk about this kind of stuff all the time, about how to train and mindsets and pushing yourself. And so Harvey already has that. But what I felt was missing from the formula there, mm-hmm. and I know he had tried to talk to me about it in like a half conversation. He was like, what are your rates? And you know, I, and he was talking about the Guinness thing. And then he found out that I was booked for a show that night and the conversation kind of stopped. But I don't care. I'll do anything for my friends. Well, absolutely. I care, him. I care, absolutely. For, I care about him. I appreciate him. you being here tonight. Yeah. Well, I like you. We're, we're friends. There's no Whatever question. Whatever you need. I appreciate that. And... Uh, it's rare to find people like that, right? Absolutely. It's, it's rare to find people Salute, who do what friend. they say. Yeah. Salute. Oh, h- hang on. You need another one. <laughs> In this pocket's got one. There you go. Hoop. Salute. Uh, salute. Chin chin, right? Who pull, pulls Crown <laughs> Royal out of their pocket already poured in the shot glass? I love this guy. <laughs> I'm very popular at parties. That's oh why they pay me. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if I can go for a third. I hope you don't have another one in there, but this is very appreciated. No problem. Oh. You got a bottle of Crown Apple right there. This isn't, this is regular Crown. It's okay. Yeah, we have a liquor. This show has kind of evolved. And and, and I want to thank you first before we continue. Um, What's what's amazing is once in a while I'll get a guest on who really does their homework on our show, mm-hmm. and you have you've sampled a, gr- a great many of our shows, and, and that that means the world to me. And I want to thank you for that. It's not required for a guest to come on at all because it's about them, but you actually having a working knowledge of what we've done so far is flattering to me, and I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate I you, and I love what you're doing. And thank you. I'm glad that this kind of show exists, and this format exists. Okay, and I do the same thing with my clients. I do my homework. Yeah, I think it's important, and I think... Um, That's why they get a personalized experience. I, and it's, it's better. And it's funny. I love the word being... I love the, the word curation or being a curator, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to... And I get paid for that, like luxury event curator. You do. Right? And we'll talk about... I mean, that's yeah. a fascinating part of what you do. I want to mm-hmm. hit that tonight. But I think in a weird way, I'm, I'm trying to curate the best experience I can for whoever our audience is, it's who, who's becoming very loyal, and I appreciate that. But I want to bring diversity... And not in the traditional sense of diversity, but also in field diversity, mm-hmm. in areas of life, areas of experience diversity on here to keep it interesting and keep it done. Um, well, you certainly won't get any harder than me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and selfishly, as we talk on the phone, uh, the selfish thing for me on this show is I'm having a time in my life, but it, and it has to be entertaining for me. It has mm-hmm. to be interesting for me if I'm going to do my best job helping present. Does that make you know, any it's sense? funny because I, I teach as well. I teach serious students, and I was actually involved with an online magic school as a professor for a while, not any, anymore. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I'm busy working. Yeah. You know, you're, like people you're are like, extremely why busy schedule. Yeah. There's like the International Bro- Brotherhood of Magicians is, is having their, their <laughs> annual conference in Pittsburgh this year, and I'm friends with the people who run the convention center, and they're like, So are you coming? I says, No, they're all amateurs. I don't have anything to talk to them about. <laughs> I'm going to go do a job. Like people, uh-huh. like people found out I'm going to Ohio this weekend to work a show, and they says, "Oh, you go? Are you going to the Columbus Magic Fest?" This is no. I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. I don't have time for that. Right. right, right. I get it. You I know, totally I don't have time. get it. You know, I love I totally the amateurs. They're, they're 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 my big. They're biggest fans, right? They're enthusiasts. I love them. It's just, right. That's not what I want to talk about. When I get together with, excuse me, other serious performers, mm-hmm. we actually have similar conversations like we're having where we talk about performance. We don't mm-hmm. talk about how things work. Right. Unless, we, get unless there's something that we happen to need to know. We're like, I'm trying to figure this out. You know, we, we don't we don't sit there and do sleight of hand with each other. Got uh, it. We, Got we, it. We, we, we talk about the subtleties of performance or how to handle audiences in different ways. Okay. Okay, so it's a little bit like yeah. If you watch comedian in cars getting coffee, it's like those kinds of com- conversations. I've tried, but you know it's. I funny. love that show. I'm sure, you, and it's funny you said that because I knew you would. 
Because I identify tr- with I, all those jerks. Right. Well, I think for people that are in the business as yourself, in that field, I think it's beautiful. I think for the average fan, I don't, yeah, know, well, how, well, I don't, I don't know how success. I don't know how successful it's been for him. I don't have any numbers in front of yeah. me. But I, I, it doesn't resonate the, the way I don't think that and even a stand-up or a Seinfeld the show did. It, it's different. It's it, different. Well, it's a talk show. But the thing quick, is, a quick I, talk show. Because Kevin is. Hart was on there, and I, I listened to the whole thing, and I did Which was fun. You liked it? Yeah, I liked all of them. My favorite was the Mel Brooks Carl Reiner one. I have but, to you know. see that. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. I got to see that but, one. But, you know, those two were those two, were two of my biggest influences. So. Right. Uh, but no, I love that because, like, I don't identify with and get on with a lot of magicians or mentalists. Right. Because what I do and what I care about is very different than got what it. they do. Got and it, I got perform it, got at it. a different level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll critique their work because they ask me to, and then they regret it. Because ah. I'm telling them things. Let me, there, there, there's a modern uh, composer called named Charles Rinnan, one of my three favorite composers. Okay, and he uh, he he he's got his, he got his start as a serial composer and an electronic composer, but now he's just an amazing composer doing things that I think in about a hundred years we're going to start analyzing like like we did with Bach. Interesting. And and, and and create whole new musical systems like we did with Bach. Interesting. And. Uh, he wouldn't say who it was, but he ha- talked about in an interview how a very well-known, very prominent artist, who, who musician, singer, etc., who world famous, many platinums, came to him and said, "I'm not versed in musical theory. Would you please transpose everything for me and start teaching me?" And he says, "Look, you can get somebody for a lot less money than me." to transpose for you and just write your music for you. But if I start teaching you, you're going to understand what it is you're really doing and you're not going to want to do it anymore. I believe that. So when I have conversations with people, they got to be serious about it. Yeah, no, I get that. And here's here's a little side for you. Did you know that Steve I got his start by transcribing? Oh, I know. All of Frank Zappa's work. Yeah, he he sent. He sent. He he came up to him backstage and gave him a transcription of Tamershui Duin, which is insane. That's piece. Of course, I know this stuff. Uh, (laughs) But modern tablature, which is dumbed down guitar, came from Steve I. I mean, I know modern tablature. When tablature friends is is if you start playing guitar, you can go on the internet and there's little dots and numbers as to where you should put your fret your hand on the fingerboard and that's how you learn guitar Steve I as, invented that as opposed to learning how to read music which would be the better way to do it but much more complex tablature the easy inroad to guitar was invented by Steve Vai mm-hmm. he doesn't get credit for it and he probably isn't getting monetized for it either that's okay he but made he, all that money with Wenger he's good he did a with who what, what, what was the big band he oh, made Wenger. all his money? Oh. Wenger uh, no, he's with David Lee Roth for a while. He was yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who was the who was the big guitar guy with Winger? The guitar guy. I tried to not to pay attention to them. Kip, I know Kip was the singer, right? Yeah. A uh, Red Beach. Was it Red Beach, a Pittsburgh guy here? Was I don't it him? Remember. I don't remember. Okay, no, Sorry, no, no. Reb, if it's not but, but you. But no, he made all his money with David Lee Ross. You're right. I, I was confusing it. Not and right and his solo work and his endorsement were carving amplification. Right, I mean, he, but he made tons of money. And he wrote a lot it, of it, scores, and he and he was in yeah. a movie with Ralph Macchio. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, but where he made his money from was touring with artists that he didn't really respect very much and right. making mad money. Exactly. And he's on record of saying this. And uh, damn it! Now I now I have uh, that dead horsey song stuck in my head. Uh, I love that song. Uh, but uh, in the video where he's painted in gold, uh-huh. uh, I love that song. My canary sings to that song. But uh, so, so so no, he he made all that money, and mm-hmm. he said so, mm-hmm. touring with people that he didn't really respect. Right, music absolutely. He hates. Yeah. So that way he could retire. Playing pop music. Yeah. Pop, so so he rock. could retire and write and be a composer and not care what people and do think. what he wants to do. And so he does like all those guitar seminars and courses where he said uh-huh. that his pricing is basically based on what it literally costs him to do it. And that's because he just wants to help people and, and make better music in this world and, and, and get, make people better musicians. Well, wouldn't you agree, like, one of um, one of his contemporaries, a little older than him, which I, I view in, in my life to be one of the most influential, the most awe-inspiring guitar players I've ever seen and met, which is Al Di Miola, mm-hmm. the jazz guitarist oh, from the fantastic. 70s. And that's it. I was right over there on the wall. Oh, really? And, oh, but yeah. Al, but Al's famous line was, Talent does not equate 
financial reward. Now I have bir- in the guitar. Now I have birds of fire going through in my head. The, <laughs> very good in the guitar world, which yeah. is you know Al, Al and Steve Vai and these guys mm-hmm. can, can Larry Coryell bef- right before Al. All these jazz guys can run rings around even Eddie Van Halen, as mm-hmm. good as Eddie is. When we people it, it, talk about the best guitarist, that's a very subjective uh, oh, thing. Oh, it's beyond You're subjective. Saying, yeah, so, but you can talk about very skilled guitarists and expert Django guitarists. Django Reinhardt, if you want to go all the way back, right. back to the beginning. But, here, but, but this is all relative, too. It's based on who we've heard of and who's become prominent. Robert Fripp was very fond... Oh. Is Fripp, yeah, who, we didn't even talk about that yet. Yeah. But he's been quoted multiple times on this subject as well, where it upsets him. Uh, because people call him the best, and he's very they humble do. about it. But from, from a technical standpoint, he's, he, playing he's it's hard there. to argue. He, he's up. He, 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 he's he, up there. He is a master. That's uh-huh. all I'll say. He's yeah. a master. Because at that point, we're, we're, what's the criteria? How do we become objective? Well, most people so, say money is the criteria. That, that means nothing. I know. It, well, of so, course, it doesn't mean anything. But that's the that's society, no, right? Robert Fripp has said was this debate is silly because as far as he's concerned, the best guitarist he has ever heard play is the guitarist in the wedding band where he got his start in London, who never made it anywhere, but he says that's the best guitarist he has ever met in his life. Have you ever, ever like, heard noodled his around on YouTube the last couple of years and see these like, like nine-year-old Chinese girls just oh, they, playing like... The savants, just, yeah. It, so, it's very technical, and that's what we're talking about with the mm-hmm, performance when I mm-hmm. talk about things, too, is I care about what you're going to get out of it. I don't want... That's why I don't like the term trick. I don't want you to see a trick and go, that's cool, because anybody can do that. Got it. If they learn it. Got it. But if I can provide you with the emotional part of it, making it a piece of theater and, and, and hopefully improve your soul... Where it's moving, where there's value to it, right? Correct. Well, there's more value than just eye candy. Got it. Got it. Or got ear it, candy, it. like you were talking about. Yeah, I think this is, you know, Eddie. Where there's, I, a, I like where Eddie. there's artistry to it. And when I say artistry, I don't just mean in like the craftsmanship. I mean like it has meaning. This goes back to what we were talking about with aesthetics, where I was talking about I spend a lot of time thinking about what's the deep meaning of what I'm doing. And sometimes I have to throw things out because I'm like, this is funny, this is hilarious, or this is deeply moving, but it doesn't meet my aesthetic and it doesn't meet my brand or my character. But really, that's an artistic standpoint as well. Okay. So I can't do it. It doesn't work for me. Okay. And in fact, a lot of people I've taught before, I said, look, there's lines that I could never say. Yeah. They just don't work for me yeah. because I don't have a bullying kind of personality. I'm right. not Don Rickles, whatever. That might work great for you. And, and people Terry Jones said the same thing in his yeah, field, too. He, he I'm has adorable. That. I know it. <laughs> I've tried to fight it. Are you adorable, Terry? <laughs> no. <laughs> and so, so, you know, and I'm irreverent, and I can get away with saying things sure. that other people can't, mm-hmm. or I'm a humongous Genesis fan. Humongous. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they actually are a big influence on me, not just their music, but the, the way Peter Gabriel used to do mm-hmm. the, the, the physical Love shows him. and everything. I actually wrote, uh, it before I had some really bad injuries, uh, I actually wrote and developed an entire um, show that was just pure magic that was a very benevolent show that has never been performed except in the privacy of my living room because I okay. can't, I physically can't do it anymore. Okay. And what that show was, was inspired by me seeing the musical box, which was a Genesis tribute band okay. uh, that were doing the pre-show Friday night at Nearfest. Uh, I used to help out with Nearfest Northeast Art Rock Festival okay. in Bethlehem, PA for 13 years. Okay. And... Uh, we brought that. That's where the Steve Hackett connections comes yeah, in. Yeah, I, we, bet. We, we, I bet. We broke Steve Hackett to the United States. He never told Soul over Got before. It. And watching them do the perform the full selling of England by the Pound tour with the full costume that they actually borrowed from wow, Peter Gabriel. That's crazy. So the authentic costumes and everything. I'm sitting there with a notebook, watching this inspired, writing this entire show, and then spent years developing the show and wow. practicing it with all this amazing sleight of hand that was big stage manipulation. And you, and you never performed it live? No, because I got hurt before I could do it. Got it, got it, got it. I was it. about to start selling got it, and then I was in a car crash. So Before we go on to, because um, I want to... And I was going to play the wind perf- controller with it, so I was going to loop oh, my own... My so word. that's the thing. I was going to loop my own sound and play all these music that was composed by myself, except for... Where I had a fella cootie cover that I had worked out. Okay. Where I figured out every single part and was gonna and it figured out how to loop all of it and play and <laughs> oh play like the sax God. solo on top of it and the guitar solo yeah, and that's everything. Not complex, huh? Psh, come on, I, I figured out how to play "Babies on Fire," the guitar solo on, okay. on, on, on my wind controller. D- d- figured that out, and I figured out. Speaking of Hackett, "Every Day" is my favorite guitar solo in the entire world, just because it's be- so beautiful. 
uh, and I used to play that. I can't Got play, it. You know, I'm out of practice, but um, I, I I want to ask is this is yeah. definitely an aside, but I think I love the sides. I think you're you may be able to c- clarify something for me. Give me give me a different viewpoint. We're both appreciators of Neil Peart, th- the philosophy, the lyrics, and what Rush did. You saw my dedication post and what that was Rush basically did. quotes from everything. And, so yeah. uh, I got um, I got about 14 years on you, probably 10 years on you. I'm, 40, I'm 54. So I was that kid growing up sitting in my bedroom with the headphones on, hiding from my parents and all that nonsense with headphones, playing with two drumsticks playing on my bed to all the Rush stuff. Yeah. By the way, you reminded and, me of that. Uh, and diving into yeah. it. My par- the, one, the one comedy thing my parents ever took away from me was that Dennis Leary's No Cure for Cancer, <laughs> which it does not hold up. It's not that good. So I, I did all this. Yeah. My question to you is about that man, mm-hmm. that band, that body of work, and in the lyrical content. It really makes... They are kind of like the outlier of 70s rock, monster rock, Godzilla rock, whatever you want to call it. They're an outliers in a lot of ways. Right. So what was it about them that resonated with a with an odd singing front man with a big nose, no sex appeal from either three of the people. Although Alex tried for a while, Getty did or, uh, not Getty. Yeah, they, Getty. A in the lot mid-80s. of ladies go Gaga for Getty. I'm just saying. However, to, that's just because he's set such a set such a good player and singer. He, I he's, think he's, so. got, he's 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 a charming man. It, there's no. I think I think all three of them. Ha- Alex is a little bit of a wild child. I think, but the, yeah. all three of them were tremendously good people, good mm-hmm. solid people, and and you all and they've three, got a big connection all to Pittsburgh. Three, Their first concert ever was here. Absolutely, but all three uniquely different. Mm-hmm. What was it about that band that found the ear, the interest, and the heart for a certain group of preteens, young teens, late teens in the seventies? Primarily male dominated. How the hell do I even answer this question? What was so unique about that? Women really resonate with them too. Where they made it though, when it was where other a lot of. Let me put it this way: I dated a girl for a while in college that Mm -hmm. when she wanted to put on some mood music, she would put on Getty Lee's solo album, My Favorite Headache. That's really odd. And she'd be like, (laughs) and she'd be like, let's romance to that album. Well, of course, she also liked to romance to uh, to Magma, and that's a weird choice. Oh my god, you even know what I'm talking about? I know Magma, yeah. Magma's amazing. My point to you is that there was, what was it? Because I've always struggled with what was different about them, uh, where Triumph was not as conceptual as them, but they came out of Canada, limited success. Yes, had a great running start, and then for the most part, had a shelf life. Although tremendous talent in that band. Oh my god, I've you seen know yes I mean? maybe more than any other but band. But that's mostly due to availability. But they didn't but I do, do like it. Rushed it. They didn't. They didn't have the longevity. Yeah. I've seen the, Rush a bunch of times. They I didn't followed have them the around. Impact. What? 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 How did that quirkiness and that weirdness break yeah. through in an era? Uh, hear me out. In an era of the Stones, mm-hmm. Peter Frampton, Andy Gibb, the Bee Gees. Uh, idol, idolistic kind of p- kiss, idolistic okay. kind of band. Aerosmith. I'm going to ask you a question. How'd that happen? Uh, How'd that I, happen? I have some answers for this. Okay, which are not complete and not definitive, right? But so you've always gonna, thought about it. Before, yes, then. But, but also, just my mind is percolating. But I'm going to I'm going to be Socratic for a moment. And ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Why do you think people are so obsessed with? Oh my God! What's wrong with my mental blinking? I am so embarrassed. Okay. Um, Pretzel Logic Band. Oh, Steely Dan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Why are people I so obsessed them. with Ste- right? Why are people so obsessed with Steely Dan? What's what's your answer to that? Because they they had like one hit, right? So they had a no. They had a huge amount of hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, that band. But they is, only ever play one on the radio. They didn't resonate on with you. It, with their, no, no, no. They did. I love Steely Dan. They have a big but body it, of work. But it's, but, it's like, but, but it's like Todd Rundgren, where they only play three of his songs on the radio, and he has one of the biggest oh, moves see, ever. I would so disagree with you. Rundgren's got a couple songs on the radio, but Steely Dan's got like fourteen songs that are on the radio. Well, I can well, name no, no, them no, all. no. That's what I said. They, they play like three songs from Rundgren on the no, radio. But, but he's got an enormous oof that in a, huge, in a hardcore following. I'm one of them, but Steely Dan has that kind of thing. Rush has that kind of thing. Now Rush had a bunch of hits. Steely Dan didn't even tour. I know they didn't tour all the years. They were really popular. They didn't tour at all. I know they're like the Alan Parsons Project, right? So, but but why but, were they his but, success? But why they weren't they, rock stars? Yeah, but why do they? But why do they appeal to people? It's a quirk. It's an outlier, right? You can't yeah. really think about but who do they appeal to. What's the demographic? Hmm. I, I would think it would be. 
well, Rush, I think, resonated very strongly with young prepubescent teens that may have felt outcasts or maybe didn't fit in. Yeah, but you could say that about Black Sabbath. That's another of my favorite bands. Yes, correct. Correct. But I love Black Sabbath. Don't get me wrong, but 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 so so that's not. Yeah, and that's, what so, is so that's part. So, so, but they're so different. Right, they're so, so, different. so first of all, there's the intellectualism of it, but there's other bands that are intellectual. Part of it, I think, is they, it is actually a Pittsburgh solution. Interesting. Is they really resonate with working class people? They started. And that's off. why I said Steely Dan. Oh, interesting. Because Steely Dan really resonates with with, with working class people yeah. too. Yeah. And and I don't mean like I get that. You know, like they resonate with blue collar. You know, th- this city, Pittsburgh, in working man is infused in the soul. Which started of this in city. Cleveland, and then they came to Pittsburgh. I think I think they actually broke. Uh, I think they broke with working man on the radio in cleveland correct and pittsburgh immediately grabbed onto that correct everything. but they performed it here first because their they first sure live date yeah. ever in the united states was, yep. oh, was uriah pittsburgh. heap who they opened for i can't remember who it was uh, it might have been uriah heap yeah well, that's a band i haven't listened to for ages yeah. they like don't two songs up. or whatever they don't hold up they were they're one of those super groups yeah, that just didn't just, work out yeah right I, i'm not a fan right uh, i was a fan but i'm not they don't hold up right. for me right kind of like dennis leary does not hold up <laughs> <laughs> uh but I, I think a lot of it is that is that is that intellectual working class mentality early on, but they but they, but peer, they peer took them that. off the deep end. I mean, Crest of Steel and like Twenty One Twelve and Farewell to Kings. These were not like you know the Kiss Rock and Roll over. We're gonna go back. We're gonna drink some beer. We're gonna back get laid in the back of the parking lot, and I'm it's gonna beat somebody de- up. Right? It's a I mean, it was different. De- it's a different demographic. And but we all kind enough, of dug it though. And there's enough it's of weird. that demographic. But they also have enough of that hard rock feel they sensibility. Do. They do, and they appeal to the people. And because they're master mu- 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 musicians, they were weird, right? There was but, a weird but, but, but thing they, about but, them. But the quality of their playing, while still being accessible, was very high to the point where they are extremely influential especially the musicians, drumming. especially the drumming. But everybody, yeah. Uh, and, and that's the funny thing. Like everybody's talking about Neil mm-hmm. as. Uh, we've lost the monumental drummer, and we did. Mm-hmm. But I think of him more as a thinker and a lyricist me too. and a poet. Hey, me too. No, and me I too. loved his books. Me too. I read them all as well, too. And, the, the bicycling across and that. That's, and that's what I think about. And there's a small number of people probably talking about that, but you'll notice like my post commemorating. And uh, I will admit that he... he Peart is one of the art, artists that influenced me that, that was still... That still, well, was until recently still alive that I never really got to meet. Like mm-hmm. like like I got to meet a bunch of the Crimson few, people, et cetera. Few did. Few did. Yeah. Um, I never really got to meet the, the, the Rush clan, you know. Um, I got to meet other people that influenced me. Mm-hmm. But... I picked up my first book on Plato, he, seeing he, him with a picture yeah, of it yeah. in 1990. But he's one of the people that, when he was, when he was gone... I actually had to stop everything I was doing oh, and yeah. basically cry for two hours. Yeah, I, it, it effect, and, and I'll, I'll say for the record, it affected Not me. Not basically, I did. Fa- it affected I, I'm me man very, enough to admit it, you know. Yeah, it affected me very deeply when I heard that, and I didn't think I was capable of feeling that for a musician of any, there, there's any a hand, promise. There's, a, there, there's a probably a handful of people still around that I would feel that way. Mm-hmm. I mentioned Runger, and definitely he's mm-hmm. a huge influence mm-hmm. on me, but people I haven't met. You know, I've met Frick, yeah. for example. I've met yeah. the whole Crimson Clan. Mm-hmm. Uh it, it, it's, so the, I'm talking about the fire sign theater. They're one of my biggest influences mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Proctor. I actually had some email exchanges with years ago oh, yeah? and otherwise no, but each time each two of the four, of, t- two of those four or five crazy guys <laughs> have, have passed. And Got it. I was basically devastated for a while with yeah. each of them because they're like, they taught me so much. I was telling actually, I messaged Terry after watching your mm-hmm. his interview with you mm-hmm. because he actually talked about things on an intellectual level I rarely get to discuss with people who are artists mm-hmm. or at all. Mm-hmm. And so I was recommend I was saying, look, I'm not just ta- talking to you about this because it's nice to actually have a conversation with somebody. And Absolutely. He appreci- and he appreciated that. We said we'll sure. have lunch, and you better actually do it, Terry. But uh, he. I, w- I said, look, I want to recommend something to you because you're talking about comedy concept albums and expanding right. your horizons. Is right. go pick up one of the first three Fire Sign albums and then get back to me, and I just want to see what that does to your brain. Okay. They were amazing. They they were known as the Beatles of comedy, which is a humongous Beatles fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I won't hold that against you. 
You don't have to. It's <laughs> nothing to hold against me. Is that Stones or the Beatles, right? I was always a Stones guy. I like both. But let me put it yeah, this way. What, so. what, do, do you have a default karaoke song? I don't sing karaoke. That's fair. So it, I, t- I, t- I take my karaoke very seriously. Hey, Jude. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I will sing Oh, Darling. Okay. And I will sing it in the most ridiculous because if you're if i'm gonna sing bad i'm gonna go out with style uh and i'm gonna take it very seriously so i will be on my knees like pleading with everybody oh you know screaming it you know i do like the like like the you know like 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 i nearly break down and cried i'll like grab like somebody's beer and splash tears on me yeah that's awesome yeah that's awesome i'm just everywhere when i do karaoke i'm nuts (laughs) either take me or don't take me depending on your fashion uh (laughs) You know, I'll sing Todd Rundgren's "Hello, It's Me," except oh, for, uh, except for instead of singing it, I'll I'll, bu- I'll bum a cigarette from somebody and burn it and just let it burn down and sit on a stool <laughs> and do it in a William Shatner beat poet kind of way. Like, "Hello, it's me," it's just perfectly within the phrasing too. Someone's got to videotape you doing it. That's good stuff. I know. That's We've good stuff. Been <laughs> together for a long, long while. <laughs> that's good stuff man if you ever need a reason <laughs> to smile <laughs> okay so enlighten me about is it is it is it speakeasy super speakeasy secret speakeasy Se- super secret speakeasy no, there's no super and there. actually we were secret talking speakeasy. we were talking about intellectual property off camera i'm actually yeah. having an issue right now where somebody's tr- stolen secret speakeasy and i've actually secret had to speak- engage yeah i've actually because i trademarked that i own yeah, as you should i own several trademarks i have secret speakeasy i have great american speakeasy i right. mentioned i have a phrase right. because everybody else just takes them to right, dinner right, right, uh, right. skeptic seance is another trademark uh you know so I, I take i take i earn a living through my ip yeah technically through my reputation right and what i can do for people but mm. i distinguish myself in small no small part through my brand and that ip is part of that got it so if somebody dilutes that by doing it so there was a guy who uh i, I had to contract a, a company who they're going through stuff with him right now got where he's it. refusing to comply he literally slavishly copied my secret speakeasy called it the same thing did the same <sighs> thing there's always idiots out there everywhere yeah the reason they're i found well, i love the way i found out about it this guy had performed some shows at Nemecolon. That close by? Yeah, because he, he lives in Eastern PA. Oh, boy. I'm all over the country. Yeah, I know that. So, and other people are. But he had performed some shows at Nemecolon, and they had called me up to inquire about a show for their members, and mm-hmm. I started talking about different options, and one, I started talking about, well, you know, there's also the Secret Speakeasy. We could talk right. about that if you're interested, if your budget's large enough. And they immediately basically hung up on me, says, oh, we already had the secret speakeasy guy up here and basically accused me of ripping this guy off when he ripped me off. So um, I, mm. I don't, I probably shouldn't talk too much about it right mm. now, but literally I had to hire a trademark company firm to yeah. send this guy cease and shame. Assist, and it's he's shame. not been complying. It's a shame. It, it's it's going to get, I don't care. I'll bankrupt this fucker. So what is this? What he, is, he, he, he's really diluted my brand. What is the concept of secret speakeasy? Yeah. Okay. So and how did it come about? Like, where did the idea come from? So w- there's a story progression for all of this. So you and asked me about the way I promote, th- you know, I used to get involved with promoting things. So me and a couple of friends, uh, no less golden Adam Holquist, who are not actually Adam is in the entertainment industry. Now he kind of semi retired as an engineer and okay. he has a, he, he's an, he, he, he's an amazing, uh, electronic composer and pioneer. All right. And he calls himself one wayness. One wayness. I know he's great. He's, he's, he's a good friend. He's from Erie. We haven't okay. talked for, for ages okay. because he's in Erie. I'm bad at that long All distance right. thing. Uh, and locally, one of my best friends, Noah Les Gold, who's a, who's a nurse now, uh, when we were all in college together in the mid nineties, we're all big prog heads and we're all interested in, and I'm interested in, you know, we're all interested in modern, uh, you know, composers right. and, and modern music ensembles and things of that nature. Dream and theater experimental bands, like, right. not even close oh you're beyond that huh? no, no 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 like like for for example one of the groups that we brought was uh, you ever heard of the band can mm. uh you know you know you who craft work is yeah, i sure do okay so uh there's this is not a racist term mm-hmm. before anybody gets upset this is what the people in germany called it they came up with this phrase okay it's called kraut rock okay and this is basically a post-World War II uh, experimental rock scene. 
the music scene in Germany. So you've heard of Tangerine Dream? Yes. So th- those are two bands, um, Klaus Schulze. Uh, who w- was a big figure, fr- found a Tangerine Dream, right. big figure in general. Bands like Can and Almond Duel 2, okay. uh, and uh, Ashra Temple, uh, Faust. Okay. The, the, these are big bands from that era that were big influences okay. in the world. All right. Uh, so, uh, what the heck's his name? I'm terrible with names tonight. Uh, I can't believe I just forgot his name. I, I can remember everybody's name, but the person I'm trying to remember from Can. There's Jackie Liebzeit, who who who. who Wait uh, to get to be my age. <laughs> who was the drummer? Holger Zuke, who was the uh, who who is the bassist, who actually helped found the minimalist mo- movement in okay. modern music. Uh, and it's, Can was one of the early experimentals with tape and, and samples and okay. tape samples as okay. well. So there. Oh, Damo Suzuki okay. was, was, was their singer, and we brought him to town. So, like, this kind of weird esoteric stuff. We actually brought Faust to town when they were touring. Okay. We brought all these weird experimental bands to town, okay. uh, a lot of prog bands. Uh, there's a group semi from Pittsburgh called Echolin that was kind of the last uh, grand experiment of okay. signing a prog band to a major label. Okay. Uh, which didn't work out because people don't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they're very good friends of mine, although we haven't talked for a while. They're, they're, we used to promote them all the time and right. help them out. And, uh, you know, it, just all sorts of bands like this and, and interesting acts. And uh, we would have, so, so that's where Tony Levin comes in, mm-hmm. where we were promoting the California Guitar Trio before they hit big. We would bring them to town regularly. And for a while, they were touring with Tony Levin. So it was California Guitar Trio with Tony Levin. Okay. And we actually, the first time we did that with them, we put them on at the Frick Fine Arts Building. Really? Yeah. Because the, the Frick Fine Arts Building has that wonderful arts auditorium with right. that flat I'm level stage. I'm with it. Right. Okay. Right. So for, for anybody who isn't, though, it, it's flat level stage. Mm-hmm. So the first row is the same level as everything else. So you can literally get up and shake hands with the people and, you know... And uh, so we promoted them there. And I still remember, we because t- Tony has this thing where he likes to take, t- to sample local cuisine wherever he goes. So he says, what's Pittsburgh like? And uh, it was really late. It was like 2 a.m. So all that was open was Ritter's. Okay. So okay. we took him to Ritter's and he had some pierogies, which I disagree <laughs> pierogies. While, while the pierogies are part of the soul infused with Pittsburgh, they right. are not a Pittsburgh dish. No. They're a Polish dish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I actually was at a conference for meeting professionals that were bringing people from all over the world for this event. And we had this big pierogi stand to promote Pittsburgh cuisine, and everybody was mocking Pittsburgh, going, really? Come on, we have pierogies here, too. We all love pierogies. We're all Polish. You know? but, but we, which is not to say that we shouldn't love pierogies here, too. It's right. just, you know, why should we? We don't own pierogies. Right. Uh, we certainly own a lot of varieties of pierogies, though. We do. We love them more than most people, but we, we don't do. own them. So, but but he had some Ritter's pierogies, and they bring it to him on this dish that is like this thick with oil, right? And he's just staring at them like this. This is my. This is what he does. He's they're floating in oil. Should and he pokes it and like skates across the path, like so. So this goes way back, right? So the reason, we, so what we would do was this is before the internet proper, because we're talking like ninety six, right? And so how do you promote stuff? Well, we would just print up flyers and put yeah. them around, put yeah. them on campus, mm-hmm. uh, telephone poles. Back when uh, what the, what, the, what was the name of uh, one of the big promotion companies is not around anymore. From back then, Caesar Engler. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th- one of the guys on the Caesar Engler kind of liked us, mm-hmm. and they just wanted to, you know, like Richard like a, Pat, right? Rich, I think Rich it might have been Richard. Oh, okay, uh, but he just wanted like a couple hundred bucks, and they would put it on the poster sometimes, oh, that cool. kind of thing. Yeah, right. and they would help promote a little bit. And so, what would happen was us three friends. What would ha- they, we would front the money for these bands, mm-hmm. ensembles, whatever, to come into town, and for them to ship. Uh, and, and by the way, speaking of rapper, we were big into nerdcore rap, nerdcore, nerdcore. nerdcore hip hop. What is that? You basically geeky geeky people shouting about k- k- net rapping about nerdy stuff. Okay. Mostly a bunch of angsty white boys, but there's pl- <laughs> but the Optimus Rhyme is is black and he's amazing. Yeah, that's white, goes right off from my head. <laughs> white. There's this guy named White E Cracker. Okay. You know, you know, white Y Cracker. You know. MC Frontalot is probably the most skilled of them. MC Chris is another well-known okay, guy. Okay. Um, 
So we brought a few of those guys, from the mostly mostly MC Front a lot, and I kind of <laughs> let my friends bring the rest of them along because I don't like the rest of them. I just liked I liked I. I just liked MC Front a lot. He was a good friend. <laughs> uh, so, Damien, if you ever watch this, I miss you. We haven't you haven't hung out at my place. Do you hear pinball that, Damien? <laughs> yeah, Damien, you have, Damien has. You haven't played pinball at my place for ages. What what what, what gives? Yeah, what gives, Damien? Yeah, I, I own six pinball machines. I love pinball. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, uh, we get more to talk about. Yeah, that. so. Uh, it, anyway, so so what happened was we would front them the money. And what they would do with the money is they would ship all their equipment to us if they needed to. Okay. Like, Damien, F- MC Frontalot, lived in New York. He would just drive over. But people who had never been out this way before, yeah. sometimes even overseas people, who would make sure... That, so Because it's cheaper to just crate their stuff no and ship question. it. No question. Yeah, no question. So their stuff would live at my house, and they would come and they would frequently stay at my place. Okay. And then they, we would basically just take back from the ticket receipts whatever money... Uh, that we had vested makes in. sense, and then we and while we could have kept the rest, we didn't keep any more because we were college kids. We didn't care. <laughs> but that's not what we were doing. We were doing this in order to have you know in, in order for French TV to finally come through. No, TV. I understand. Yeah, and, I get it. it's a reoccurring theme in college. Yeah, <laughs> and so and, and then they would get their back of sales, etc. And uh, you know. Uh, th- th- there's actually a nerdcore hip hop song by uh, MC Lars about how uh, he really all, all musicians are just in the t-shirt business. <laughs> <laughs> there's a little element of truth to that. Probably. Yeah, actually, Todd Rundgren on, on a recent album wrote a song about you know buy our, you know come here come to see sneak in the show just buy the t-shirt. You know, <laughs> he wrote a song about that recently too. Uh, I have a lot of concert t-shirts, <laughs> uh-huh. but so and we would hang out with our with these guys. And they were, some of them became our friends, mm-hmm. and we would promote them at places that don't exist anymore, like the Millville Industrial Theater oh, yeah. that deserve yeah. to be condemned. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, uh, well, the the Frick Fine Arts exist, obviously, but you know wherever we could get it, Garfield Artworks is still around. Uh, there was a, there was an art gallery underneath Forward Lanes. I didn't know that. Where the where, where the Chinese place is now. Okay. For a while. Okay. And Manny, who owned the stage at. Uh, this is in between. This is when uh, the Millville Industrial Theater closed and Manny was looking for a new permanent place, which became the Garfield Artworks. Yeah. So he parked his sta- that stage he owned in this place for a while. Okay. In, in, on Ford did Avenue. I did not know that. And we stopped having concerts there because this is hilarious. The bowling lane complained to us about the noise. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> You're surprised by that? Yeah. It's Pittsburgh. I know. So we need we need a reason to complain about anything. So 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 we would promote all these interesting things. Okay, and this is great for these these bands or whoever they were because they got to come. Pittsburgh is a gateway to mm-hmm. a number of places. There's mm-hmm. a gateway to the Northeast, the Southeast, and the Midwest. So they would get to come here and make enough money to get their tour bus and and, and, and some food and whatever else they needed to continue along got the it. tour got and it. then finance that way so they would get to tour in a way that they never got to before. Okay. We would break them to new audiences. Okay. So that's what we were talking about earlier about the Orion at Baltimore and the Odeon in Cleveland was if they frequently one of their next stops would be one of those two mm-hmm. depending on the direction they went to. Mm-hmm. And we were good friends with the guys who ran the, the, the Orion in Baltimore Okay. And, who were big prog heads and stuff. Yeah. And we used to help them and everybody else out with pro- run prog day down in North, North South Carolina for a while in Chapel Hill. And so we would break a bunch of these bands in and we would then follow them the next night. And oh my God, like we would drive to Baltimore the next day after staying up all night with these people and then drive back the same night in that horrible fog. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And you know what I'm talking I about. I sure do. I and, sure do. Or, or, or the Cleveland drive to and from was much easier. Yeah, from Balt- from Baltimore to Pittsburgh, absolutely. Yeah. So so we would do, we'd do this. So this okay. is one of the things we would do. And we would just hope. And we wind up selling out a lot with it by accident. Got it. We didn't know what we were doing. Got it. And so, but but the point of this was I wanted cutting edge art to happen. And I've always been obsessed with interactive theater. Okay. So everything I've always done, that's why as a performer, I try to do everything interactive. I don't, even as a musician, I was always obsessed with ways to make music interactive. That's why I love one of the things that Harvey did was he basically had an interactive mm-hmm. rap installation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, and I was very happy to do my friend that 
solid and mm-hmm. helped stay up with him through the long dark night and mm-hmm. keep him sane by having another performer who knew what he goes through you know right he, he would wrap me up aren't you tired man are you tired <laughs> and i could see him droop and i get up and dance and smile and be like no man i'm here with you i'm marathoning too i slept for two days i can't imagine what that poor man is going through uh-huh. considering i just stayed up with him got it got he it. actually did it oh yeah. my god and that, that did, man is a he did that it man is a machine not me no, he's a machine that man is amazing i love that man that's a monumental achievement he made. Uh, so anyway, so so that's one aspect of it. And I would get involved with local experimental modern music ensembles. Okay. okay. Where I would, I'm one of those people where in my career as a project manager, that's why I became one. I started as like data analyst, database guy, sure. software engineer, that kind of stuff. Sure. Kept finding myself in charge. I wanted a VP of IT for I. Uh, for, 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 for pharmaceutical for a while okay. I wound up running the PMO for an entire major fortune 500 okay. bank for, for years and, and, and you know and developing all these unique things so like I made my mark on the world in all these weird ways that people don't even know but they're benefiting from the work I did in the background constantly with mm-hmm. all these unique products mm-hmm. uh, d- d- data products basically and uh, I retired from that and started doing what I do now and by accident I fell into this world I went out to the West Coast to interview around with friends who were in the video and card board game card game industry, got a bunch of jobs doing this, and kind of didn't look back. Okay. Yeah. It was total by accident. I fell into doing it full time. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the short version, but... <laughs> right, right, right. So, and I'd like to do more in Pittsburgh, to be fair. Mm-hmm. But, so, so I've always been in, obsessed with this. And with curating and helping to craft all these fascinating experiences, and I got involved with performance art. I was telling you off camera before, I was good friends with Jackie and Steve O'Haron mm-hmm. from uh, Squonk Opera for years. Right, all right. And I, we, we, the three of us used to, you know, me, me, No, and Adam used to help them out with their projects early on. Uh, and they found their stride and catapulted to wonderful sure. stardom right and i love them those guys i haven't right. talked to them in ages because they moved out to a farm and they don't talk to anybody anymore okay and um and steve and i always connected because we both play a mid- wind midi controller people listening look it up okay <laughs> so i got involved with like weird experimental modern music ensembles where right. i would r- write and arrange pieces um, still, one of my favorite pieces I ever ar- arranged was a was a version of Heroes, okay, the David Bowie song. Okay. Be- speaking of Robert Fripp, I've always been obsessed with, uh, and in love with not just that song, but that one long sustained note that he actually sustains. He doesn't use an ebo; he actually sustains it to from the start to the finish of the song and he just bends it up about a quarter tone up right. and down a little bit right so i focused on that okay and wrote an entire piece with the entire ensemble passing the note that one note around and everything else subdued in the background okay it was kind of like a my bloody valentine kind of thing who i hadn't heard of then but i have now so now i can make a reference got it uh, with the, like like the uh the, the wall of sound with everything having equal voicing okay if you're familiar yeah, with my I get it. okay yeah so so I've been obsessed with this my entire life of bringing cutting edge theater. Uh, I was peripherally involved with attack theater way back in the beginning. What the hell is that? Th- they're they're a modern um, kind of ballet dance thing. Okay, uh, they're they're fascinating. All right, uh, they're kind of like me where they play to the highest denominator in the room and everybody else comes along for the ride. Okay, and um, I just helped with so like promotion and stuff like that, and uh, you know securing venues. So then, and I was doing all this until I basically went full time doing what I do now all right. as a performer. And then I took a break from all of that for a while because I was making a living basically giving talks mm-hmm. and being a one man show. Okay. And the thing is, as I developed that sense of being an artist, because when you do that full time and you're all over the country performing, right? performing sometimes hundreds of shows a year. Because actually, I went around when I was around the country. I trained with different masters. Okay. And what they would do is they would tell me go out and practice it. So I'd go out and do you know what busking is? Yes. Okay. So I'd I go, do. I do. I would go out like in New Orleans. I'd go out to Jackson Square and just busk in order to l- practice what they taught me. And that's out on the street, right? Yeah. Busking. Yeah. And l- yeah. And let me tell you, when you're in the middle of a park, and people have dinner and places to be, mm-hmm. and they can just walk away, they will. 
Mm-hmm. You got to find a way to grab their yeah, attention. Yeah, when you're performing at an event, people will be polite to you sometimes. Oh, yeah, if you're captive. Right. But when you got to stop people and you got to keep them captivated and then get them to pay you big bucks mm-hmm. but by putting it in the hat afterwards. Mm-hmm. And they stopped what they were doing for half an hour and then gave you 20 to $50. That's yeah. when you knew you did something right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So that, that that's a crucible you put yourself through. Okay. Okay. Because I, I didn't do it because I needed the money. I did it because I wanted to practice. Okay. And I did that in b- places all over the country. All right. Just to practice. Or I would even go to perform somewhere for like a conference and I'd be like, okay, where's an interesting place to go do this? Just to try some stuff out. Okay. Just see what people really think. Yeah. And um, and I was always very respectful. I dressed well. And, right. You know, if a police officer came up to me, I was real respectful. You know, I was I, I didn't look like I climbed out from behind a gutter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Yeah. So anyway, so, so, so I took a break and was doing this to, to be a performer, which is what I still primarily get paid for, mm-hmm. is to perform at upscale events, corporate conferences, right. corporations, hospitality suites, do the brand bonding like we were talking about. Right. That kind of stuff. So what happened was early on i realized when i was working things like hospitality suites and working for people who cared about giving their clients good experiences or giving their guests good experience whatever because i have a master's in project management i and because i believe in always over delivering anyway i'm that kind of person i would wind up basically consulting for people and making their events into proper experiences and making them really good or even when i'm at the event you're not just getting me to perform. You're getting all that expertise where I know how to talk business because I've been a business. I've been a junior executive. Uh, I've been all these things from from the ground up to pushing carts all the way up, you know? Okay. So I know how to talk to people and understand what they care about and have, make sure we have a great time. Like I work events where I work, uh, where, where like the other day I was, work, the other month I was working at a um, an executive dinner and I work a lot of executive dinners where I sit at the table with the CEO and before dinner's even open, he hasn't even seen my show yet. He's going, can I have your resume? Mm-hmm. This happens regularly, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Is it, we need somebody like you. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so so anyway, I'm doing all, all, all of this work and I find myself consulting and not getting paid for it, basically. Okay. So I said, what's a good way for me to consult? A lot of people call their shows different things. And for me, naming things is really tough. That's the hardest thing in the world is for me to name something. I really overthink it. Okay. Overthink everything, but you know, I really <laughs> overthink naming. So I said, you know what? Instead of naming my show, I'm going to name the experience with the consulting. And that's also the name of the show. Okay. So it's kind of both. Uh, so that way people can get a sensibility of what I'm going to offer. So that way you understand when you hear secret speakeasy, what immediately comes to mind? Just, just well, as, as just sp- cut, cut, speak- just cut, spit it out. Uh, speakeasy bars were already secretive to, it was, in their origin, correct? Right? I mean, it's kind of redundant. But what's the imagery that comes to mind? I mean, oh, like uh, a little bit sleazy, a little bit of fun kind of uh, bar environment where um, a little edgy, mm-hmm. uh, anything goes. Yeah, that's fair. And I wind up working a lot of black tie or, you know, jacket require kind of experiences, uh-huh. high-end experiences. That makes it better. Yeah, I know, right? Exactly. So for some many people, everything you said comes to mind, but it also brings to mind kind of like an elegant mm-hmm. secret party or back room. Got it. And they want to give an exclu- or an exclusive, exclusive. experience. Right. So right. they want, that's what they want to have. So that's what I can help them design is this exclusive high-end experience that has this edginess to it, but still has an elegance to it. Invitation only. Exactly. Okay. And so, and I came up with the phrase great American speakeasy in a, in, in a moment of inspiration early on because a client said, yeah, that's because I was talking about a more intimate event because I prefer intimate experiences. Sure, sure. I will actually charge you more sometimes for an intimate experience because I know that I'm going to be, have a chance to customize something for every person in the audience, an audience mm. of 2000 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can only do a f- few prominent people. Okay. So it's actually, there's certain amount, sometimes it's more preparation work for me for the intimate ones. I get it. I can see that. 
So, and plus that's more special, that's more exclusive. Everybody in the room that wants to do something cool is going to do something cool. I feel that that's more valuable personally. Okay. For you to have that really intimate experience that you know will never be repeated again. And a lot of good improv comics will talk about that. Okay. And I do the same thing where I make sure that what happens in this room tonight will never happen this way again. And in fact, you might say sh shouts. I don't think, I don't th believe in hecklers. These are people that are helping me make a craft a unique experience. They mm -hmm. become part of the show, mm -hmm. becomes running gags, run, running whatever. Mm -hmm. They might shout something off and be like, forget what I was going to do. Let's do this instead because this is fun. You just gave me an idea and I'm going to do something I'm never going to do again. Got it. So it's unique then. Yeah, it is. And good improv comics are like that too, where what happens in that room that night will never happen again. Got it. Got it. Okay. And so... So I said, well, how do I get paid for that? So I came up with these terms. And it also is saying, these are the kind of events and experiences or situations you should hire me for. You should hire me for those and not your backyard BBQ. Right? <laughs> Understood. I mean, you can hire me for those, but I mean, the secret <clears throat> speakies, you don't have me consult. Come on. How, how much How much information sure. do you really need to make sure. your backyard BBQ amazing? Uh -huh. Other than just have me perform. Got it. Got it, got it, got Which it. Which is what's going to make it amazing. But... I, I personally feel that every party sucks unless I'm performing at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's called confidence, my friend. That, that is that. that that'll, that'll never let you down. That's what the ladies like. That's, uh, that's exactly not right. Not this face, that's for sure. <laughs> Self-depreciating humor also won't hurt you. <laughs> that won't hurt you. Getty Lee is more attractive than me. So... <laughs> Uh, his wife may think so. I don't know. You know what? I you know what? I realized years ago that if uh, Billy Joel can land Christy Brinkley, I've got a chance. Yeah, that was a lesson learned in the mid '80s, early '80s. That's what I'm right? saying. <laughs> I mean, that was like the Vulcan Aphro Aphrodite pairing right there, right? I think there was a component of money involved in that too. I, I mean, hate to hate to say that, but there probably. Well, you know, wealth is, wealth can be sexy, but I've seen ladies be like, "Oh my God, that guy's slime ball. I don't care how much money he's throwing at me." Mm, that's so what they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen them actually turn these guys down. But, Understood. But Understood. those guys are real sleazy. Understood. So, uh, so, so anyway, so that that's where it came from was the idea of consulting. Okay. And I said, this is a great idea. I'm going to trademark it. Okay. And I did. I went and registered both those marks. And so I started hosting basically secret parties for four people on their dime all mm -hmm. over the country. Mm-hmm. And got this reputation for being, and I wanted this. This is an intentional brand shift where I w would love to be seen more and more, and I'm already being seen that way, as the guy who is the luxury event host. Got it. The guy where you go to. Got it. Um, who also, it, part of the reason why he's intriguing is not just because he hosts these amazing events, but he does magic, he's mentalism, he's this all around mm -hmm. renaissance guys, mm -hmm. and get paid for that more and more. Got it. No, it's, it's a very interesting concept. Yeah. So High end concept. I think yeah and i think i think really big all the time mm -hmm. and i think really high end all the time mm -hmm. which is good I but, but i know how to put it in practice like uh, like, like that's the thing i've been told this multiple times by people that i'm the, the most dangerous man they've ever met and the most valuable man they've ever met because mm -hmm. i'm the person where if i tell you i will do something i will do something so by the way, a lot of magic comes that way where I'm like, I'm going to make this impossible thing happen. Fuck, now I have to do it. <laughs> Let me figure this out. <laughs> and I've invented all sorts of weird methods to do things. Okay. Um, but uh, like, 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 like how to put a signed card inside of a beer bottle that's still sealed. Yeah, how the fuck would you do that? <laughs> so... <laughs> So the girl I'm seeing, when she first met me, she, I was still figuring that out. And she says, his house was so weird. I would come over and there was all these bo beer bottles with all sorts of weird objects floating in them in different states. Yeah. And she that knows, might freak her out a little bit. And she, no, she knows exactly how I do it. And she's like, it's the weirdest. She's like, it, it, it is the most impossible way to do this. She's like, it's even cooler knowing how you do it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Some things are not like that, but that is. Okay. I'm not going to tell you, but. No, I didn't think you were going to share that, the, no. uh, the ins and outs with me on no. that. Although it's, you got, you've, you've perked my attention, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, this mentalist thing, I've never, so I've never really met a mentalist. And oh, it's yeah. part of what you do. That's part of it. So, yeah. so to finish about the secret speaking, yeah. so that's the progression yeah. was, so there's this progression of me being involved with interactive theater and cutting edge theater. Okay. 
and an art my whole life. Mm -hmm. And as a, and as an interactive performer myself, that's actually performing. I, I consider myself a, an epic theater professional. Okay. Now there's a form. I don't mean epic as in like it's so epic. It, it's this goes back to our our, our conversations about Aristotle. Mm -hmm. See, I'm a full circle kind of guy. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I I'm like Bill Cosby. I told you all these stories so I can tell you this story. <laughs> callbacks are important too all right so, <laughs> all right uh so you've heard of the epic theater po i'm sorry the epic poem form no okay so aristotle in his uh in his um seminal book on aesthetics called aesthetics okay which is the philosophy of art mm -hmm. defined the different forms of art Right. Now, since then, we've come up with more forms of art, yeah, yeah. but at the he defined at the time. Okay. So, he, he defined what is music. He defined what are paintings, mm -hmm. what is sculpture, mm -hmm. uh, a, a host of things. So, when it came, so he also defined the drama as we see it. Okay. Now, which is a plot theme and you're, um, you know, you can become emotionally involved and uh, you have a, what, what's it called? A, a suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. and you get sucked in. Mm -hmm. uh, so... And then he defined poetry, and he defined a form of poem called the epic poem. Okay. So the Odyssey is an epic poem. Right. The Iliad is an epic poem. Right. Uh, the Enid by Virgil is an uh -huh. epic poem. Okay. Beowulf is an epic okay. poem. Dante's, uh, Dante's Divine Comedy is an epic poem in three parts. Three, so yeah. Three it, parts. It's, it's, people should go watch Terry's episode. See, yeah. I'm going to make people watch your other episodes. <laughs> uh, to, to talk about the details of how the Divine Comedy is constructed, because Terry did such a good job talking about that. There's yeah. no point in me repeating Got it. it. Just go watch that. Got it. Uh, so, uh, Paradise Lost is an epic poem. So, what, what epic poems are, are is they are poems uh, that are basically story form that detail some uh, uh, a heroic figure's journey in an episodic format okay now what's interesting about the episodic format is you can f you you can t frequently take the episodes and pull them out and just tell them by themselves right like we tell, stand alone yeah like all the different spots on odysseus's adventures mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. Stand alone, and we tell the story of him right. with the Cyclops or him with the Hashish Eaters just by itself. Right. And also, what's going on is they are dialectical in nature. Mm -hmm. They can also be didactic, but they're mm -hmm. primarily dialectical in nature. So, what they're doing is they're trying to get you to intellectually engage with the meaning and the concept going on. They're not morality plays because morality plays are not art. They have mm -hmm. artistic elements, but their mm -hmm. primary purpose is not an end in and of itself. That's an important to find. Yeah, no their question. Um, so, 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 so they're different, but w so a way that the, the Greeks would do it was they would do what's called invoking the muse where at the front and start of every single episode, mm -hmm. the, the uh, the poet the bard would invoke the muse he would pray to the gods and talk to you about what he's about to sing about and give him the strength to tell you the story and he would occasionally break the fourth wall even during it and talk to you about Got it. it and this is what so there's a so so, so th these are the elements that make up epic epic poem form now epic but aristotle never defined it for theater okay but epic theater sort of existed in various forms through the millennia mm -hmm. but uh there's a couple gentlemen the most prominently known one is bertolt brecht if you've heard of him i've heard of him i'm not familiar with him though so do you know the the composer kurt vile uh -huh. he so bertolt brecht is most famously known for probably most famously known for writing the ten penny opera oh and, really and he teamed with kurt vile and kurt vile was his lyricist and, mu and, and songwriter okay i can for, connect the dots for, for all of the operas okay. and plays that okay. brecht would write okay so songs like mac the knife yes. and the canon song those come from the ten penny opera okay um, just just for frame of reference right the, the, it doesn't matter if it's pop culture reference so people know what we're talking Understood. about so we're talking like pre-nazi germany mm -hmm. and actually both these guys fret, fled the nazis and wound up in the united states for a lot of their career right so bertolt brecht is one of the folks who helped form a lot along with a bunch of other people whose names i don't remember all of them uh who helped who, who formalized and wrote the treatises basically 
on what e- epic theater is. Okay. And Brecht, even though some other people technically formalized it a, a lot at the same time as him and he worked with them, right. Brecht gets a lot of the credit because he came up with the most innovations for it okay. that we think of today. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I wrote it down because I can't remember the names of German words. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. Uh, but but there's a there, there's a form of acting called gestus acting, mm-hmm. which is like gestural acting, uh, where instead of getting to know people through their uh, th- through their emotional connection, you get to know their intents and their meanings, uh, in, in, as opposed to connecting with them emotionally through okay. their gestures. Okay. So that way you can dialectically engage with them and intellectually engage, and that's the important part of it. So. Um, Brecht was a communist, he was a Marxist, and he believed that if you just told people the truth, you know, you basically said in the form of a play and preached to them in a way that they would, their rat, their their reason would supposedly win over and they would be converted to Marxism. Right. right so, right, right. Uh, so that was his purpose of, uh, uh, of, of, of his place, but you can have epic theater and not have that be that purpose, right? Got it. So... Uh, he came up with something called the distancing effect or the alienation effect, which is the word that I'm not going to try to pronounce in French. Okay. Or, or, or German. Okay. Or in French, for that matter. <laughs> but uh, what that is, is that's what we're talking about, like, with evoking the muse. So what that does is that w- w- when you watch a drama, mm-hmm. what happens is you become emotionally engaged. You get lost in it. You are passively watching it, on the events unfold. Okay. And if it's well done, then you are sucked into it. You know, you have a suspension of disbelief Mm -hmm. and you feel, and you almost forget that you're watching anything. You're just like immersed. immersed, right. Yes. And, and by the way, as an aside, a lot of people think what I do is immersive theater and it's not. And I love immersive. Well, okay. I have a love hate relationship with immersive theater, which is a separate topic. Uh, But what I do is not immersive theater, even though there's coincidentally some parallels. Okay. And so what happens is you want to alienate or distance people from that emotional attachment so that way they can intellectually engage with the thing that's happening as it's happening okay. rather than think about it after the fact so that way they can form a dialogue mm-hmm. they can be basically dialectical with it mm-hmm. and have an intellectual discussion with it okay so i love the and they would do things like they would have the um have the actors not act and instead repeat things in monologues uh, in, like, in like very tone to yeah, monologue kind of ways I've seen and they would like flash it. lights at people yep. to remind them that they're on stage and they're watching something right. or they would run they right. would, or, or they would bring people up on stage speaking of Ayn Rand I gave a talk on epic theater at the Ayn Rand Institute's um, conference when they were in Pittsburgh and I talked about night of January the 14th as having elements of epic theater Okay. and Rand was very familiar with these innovations at the time and she was versed on Brecht and she's wrote and written about him Okay. so she came up with that the, with that audience partition, participation innovation of for Night of January the 14th where she got 14 members out of the audience every night and had them be on stage mm-hmm. and evaluate mm-hmm. whether or not because it was a crime drama in a courtroom whether or not the defendant was guilty or innocent and they had a different ending for each one got it got it so there is it's not proper epic theater but there's elements of epic theater in that play okay uh just to give you a frame of reference there okay and uh, that was actually what made her her first big one of money was because it was a got big it. it interesting every celebrity wanted to be on that jury got it she had an all blind jury with helen keller on it too and she found it fascinating how the all most pe- most juries found it innocent, but the all blind jury found it found found them guilty. And she hmm. wrote a whole article on uh, why a, on why that yeah, was why. And, w- and what happens when you're not watching things and things okay. like that. So and not seeing the full picture. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so what happens is you it's you want to distance yourself from that. You want to intellectually engage with things. Mm-hmm. So that way you can learn something. Okay. Now you still can feel things and feel very strong emotions. So what I've done with the secret speakeasies is they're technically interactive epic theater experiences. Okay. And even when I perform a show, I perform it, uh, even if it's a mixture of magic and mentalism or whatever right. I'm performing right. uh, or other disciplines, it's really an epic theater show. Got it. 
And so what I do with the secret speakeasies is I had a whole... Se- I, I, so basically, I was going to start hosting um, intimate dinner theater nights for mm-hmm. the secret, secret speakeasies for brand awareness here in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. and get some better film and all that, and ra- not just rely on word of mouth. Right, right, so right. that's what happens when you fall into a business like this. You you just make a living through word of mouth. And then all of a sudden you turn around and go, well, to get to that next level, now I need sales, marketing, and a proper website, and all these things that I've never had to care about before. Capitalism. How do I do, yeah, how do, I do that? <laughs> so that's something I need, like Got right it. now, to right. get to that next level, is I need a team of people who are proper PR people, right. not people who just make posts for me, like proper PR people, mm-hmm. and proper management and agents and marketing people to get to that next level. Uh, okay. in, in my career and I'm actively looking for that okay um, Harvey actually said that he was going to hook me up with some people in New York but he's been busy setting world records yeah, so he has hopefully been. when he he's recovered been. we'll have a time to have that chat <laughs> uh, he came out to my secret speakeasy in November and we'd been friends for a while and he was very impressed and wanted to see that succeed which I appreciate awesome. tremendous and he wants me to bring it to Nashville which I think is a great town for it Nashville well, I, mean, I can see that yeah. I can well, see that I mean, I've had them in San Francisco and uh-huh. Seattle and other places around the country uh, for, for, for private clients, and uh, they're, they're good towns for them, too. Pittsburgh's a tough town to sell things to that are high It is a tough town. We're a little archaic. We're, you know, we're, we're stuck I, in the Carnegie I don't stuff. mind to say this, but we're archaic in a lot of ways. We're also not early adopters of anything. That served us well at times with mm-hmm. certain things, but it hasn't served us well with other things as well. So yeah, it's like what Terry was talking about: how we were Pittsburgh will appropriate things after the fact. Like yes, Andy Warhol yes. despises despised Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. He hated this city and he loved New York. Mm-hmm. He's quoted as saying, "The best thing about a small town is it makes you want to get out." And he left Pittsburgh and never came back. Never talked to his family ever again. Mm-hmm. And what? What? But he's do we, buried here. Go figure. Right? But but what do we do? <laughs> we bury him here and we make a museum for him here. Yeah. But he hated yeah. this town and yeah. he hated everything about it. I'm not saying I do. I'm just talking about any world. Right? No, yeah. no, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, so so it's a we have a weird consciousness here in Pittsburgh, and I love we what do. Terry's talking was do. talking about about we how do. we have it's a tough crowd in Pittsburgh. Like, other blue-collar towns are not as tough as Pittsburgh is. Really? Yeah. Huh. I, he had a, that funny story he had about that, oh, I know. that club that he was talking about. That guy, there was, like, four people in the room, and the mm-hmm. guy stood up and challenged him, called him not funny. and <laughs> <laughs> You can almost envision that happening, right? I know. All right, so this so, mental so, 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 so anyway, so what, what happened? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was... Yes. I said, I'm going to start hosting these as dinner theater experiences. Okay. Where I'm going to be the primary entertainment. And right. And as it takes off and it gets more more money and more following, I'll open it up to larger, being larger experiences. Uh, I met a guy who wound up running to Canada with everybody's money. Uh, who, <laughs> it, because, because I wanted to start a social club around these. Uh, okay. Who, who had the means to help with that. So we started a, a social club, or he did, because... I was just contracted and I never got paid. Okay. Because so, uh, he ran to Canada with all the members' money. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Come back. Yeah, so... Uh, what? But I was subcontracted to host secret speakeasies mm-hmm. for him and I built a, a bigger following and there was demand after his organization closed down. Okay. And uh, so I said, you know what? I still want to do this, but a bunch of people were demanding the larger experiences that I was having. Sure. So that's when... I realized that I'm no longer a promoter because I don't know modern promotion techniques like Got I used it. to know how to sell stuff before. Got it. So I so I had people who came out of the woodwork saying, we love what you're doing. We want a piece of it. We're going to promote it. And then they had no idea how to sell to my demographic, mm-hmm. which is a more well-to-do demographic. Mm-hmm. And they kept bailing on me and I had to go and sell everything myself anyway. And we sold out every single one. Okay. But it was a lot of work for me to do it. Okay. I don't want to do both. Yeah, I yeah. want partners. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So uh, so I said, okay, this is great. If I'm going to start doing this on my own because there's demand, I'll do it. And uh, I wound up partnering with She Deserves, which is a beautiful charity. Right. Uh, that what they do is uh, they they help people who 
are at the point where they're self-sufficient, but one setback will spiral them back to a vicious cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. So they provide them with tools, training opportunities, and on jo business yeah, coaching wonderful. and entrepreneurial grants to start their own businesses. Okay. So I, w I was trying to raise awareness for them because they just got their 501c3. Okay. And nobody knew who they were, and I wanted to introduce them to people who could help finance them. Sure. Sure. And I, I did help them get a new website and some new copyists with a little bit of, w with some of the money, but, you know, the real benefit was introducing them Got to the it. Re people who could give them real money well, sure. and help them help people properly. Sure, sure. And I think it's a beautiful charity. I'm happy to help them out and I will continue to. Uh, Guardian Angels, which which Harvey's very yeah. responsible for, they've asked me to, they've asked me to help them out, and I'm very happy to help them with that. Okay, I can't wait. They're a beautiful charity. People should donate to that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm supposed to help them out with uh, something. It may or may not be a secret speakeasy. We need to talk, uh, but definitely for something around Independence Day, and for people listening who don't know what Guardian Angels is, they're a charity that that trains um, service dogs and pairs them with right. uh, vets. With uh, with war vets who right. have PTSD and frequently are disabled, and so basically, it's a wonderful charity. Yeah, it's a beautiful charity. These dogs literally save these people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm happy to help out with that. So what I did was I basically accidentally started my own production theater production company. Okay. So I became writer, producer, <laughs> director, everything, and promoter. Everything for these because these were all interactive plays right. masquerading as beautiful elegant events okay. the, post, the post gazette came out to our august one and right. called us the best date night in pittsburgh which i really right, appreciate right, right. and uh so there, there were plots and themes and all sorts of things going on okay uh not just me performing i only performed a full show at a couple of them and Got I it. only performed parts, small things at others because I Got wanted it. to make sure the different things. Yeah, yeah. So the the theme for the last season was uncomfortable truths. All right. Uh, so it's in which I felt was extra beautiful because it was raising awareness for uh, women's abuse charity. Sure, sure. So for example, uh, in August we had the Shiji Festival, which is Chinese Valentine's Day. And if you study the history of Chinese Valentine's Day, this is why I did this, and it was mm -hmm. held on their day. Mm -hmm. It's a lunar calendar, so it floats around a bit. And it's the seventh day of the seventh month of the lunar calendar. And it literally, I, I, I don't want to. If you want me to, I'll tell the full story of the of, of, of the of, of the tale. Uh, of, of but but basically, watching it, it you can literally um, trace through the evolution of this festival women's emancipation in china okay and in the in individualism in china okay i found this fascinating mm -hmm. and i thought it was a beautiful thing so to the point where back when it was first founded women would go to the night market and they would have to show off their housekeeping skills like their needlepoint to attract a husband wow. so they could no longer be a financial burden on their family and go join another farm mm, and go different, make different babies culture, there huh? and make some some good connections yeah with joint yeah, families yeah. and nowadays it's like what valentine's day is here where the man has to chase after the woman it's Got all it. about love and right, back then right. nobody cared about love yeah that was a tertiary factor if you like them great different culture right now it's about survival yeah mm -hmm. so i loved this idea mm -hmm. and i wanted to celebrate that because that's what these events are while the theme is uncomfortable truths i'm not putting in your face come out here and be exposed to something that you might not like mm -hmm. that i'm trying to wake you up for mm-hmm Remember we were talking about benevolence before? Yes. So what these events are is there's these uncomfortable truths lurking in the background. We sort of mention them in these beautiful ways and because I don't want to be in your face about it. You're smart. You can right. figure this shit out. Right. And so what we instead, what it is, is these are milestones that we're celebrating. We've made, th made this it. achievement. Let's celebrate it. Let's immerse ourselves in this. Got it. So I had Jin Yang who is amazing, one of the best pipa players, which is Chinese lute in the world, who happened to have just moved to Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, come and perform a concert that I curated with her that was centered around this theme. Okay. Uh, which, by the way, total plug for her. She's got a concert coming up on February 7th. Go see it. But not too many people, because I still haven't bought a ticket. I want to get <laughs> in. Uh, but she's performing a piece by one of my favorite composers, Lou Harrison, okay. who's an American composer who was called the Hobo Composer. All right. Interesting character. All right. And um, we had we had uh, modern Chinese fusion ballet. I performed some pieces that that, that were about love and romance, sure, sure. etc. Uh, in July, we had a Christmas in July event that was basically kind of a capstone celebration. Okay. So New Year's and 
July because that was the start and finish of the event series, which I had mm-hmm. every month, were, were the capstones. Uh, I did a total parody event in September where I had a Storm Area 51 after party. <laughs> and, but, the, but the idea of it was all the staff dressed up as aliens and scientists, <laughs> and we were throwing this big party that same evening of the storm, oh thanking you for liberating us that night, <laughs> that morning. And they, and, but the, but the, the, the theme was, no matter how alien somebody may seem to you, sure. stand up for their rights, oh, yeah, no matter absolutely. how impressed they are. I get it. Uh, so that's, this is what we do for all of these. So New, right. New Year's Eve was a great American speakeasy. Roaring 2020s where I just paid homage to a lot of the great American authors okay. of the 20s. Uh, so people like Herman Hess to Fitzgerald, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we had, I had a, a furtive scavenger hunt that I developed that, that, allowed, that guided you between all the different episodes going off. Okay. Within, the, within there. Okay. Uh, that, uh, that you had to do. And at the end, I had a perfect 3D replica printed by a Wizard IT. Thanks, Andy. Andy Bradburn, good friend, uh, who, who 3D printed these out for me of the Maltese Falcons, perfect replicas. Oh, very with my cool. My logo in them. Very yeah. cool. So that that was that was because that was written and filmed both in the mm-hmm, 20s. Mm-hmm. So that was what was going on. Okay. It, 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 like all sorts of things going okay. on there. Uh, so these are amazing nights where people have met at my events. Mm-hmm. And now they're engaged. Yeah, I get it. Like I get it. People have formed business partnerships from people they've met there, and they're not even networking events. They're just beautiful, elegant evenings. Got it. That are interactive plays. Okay. I've been finding out their epic, their epic theater, interactive epic theater, right. with all these episodes going off in different orders. Right, you can right, right. Engage with them or not. Right. And what I've been finding from talking to different theater professionals around the world is nobody in the world is doing what I'm doing. I knew it was unique, but I didn't know that nobody is doing what I'm doing. And so people keep making inquiries and asking me questions. Mm-hmm. The Cultural Trust scheduled, you know, had a meeting with me because they're obsessed with immersive theater right now. I think they wanted to know if I was competition and I'm not doing, I don't think they understood what I was doing. Yeah, probably not. But they just knew that I said it wasn't the same thing and that was good enough for them. So they're probably like, not. go ahead and be independent, dude. I think they <laughs> want to know if they wanted to buy me out or something. I don't know. With that said, I, I do happen to have uh, a deck of playing cards here with All me. All right. Uh, because that's the easiest way to show, so, like, the difference. You know? Okay. With mentalism, we don't need anything. Like, I could just talk to you and have you think of things. And okay. Do things. I love doing palm readings, by the way. Okay. I'll read your palm, you know, maybe on a future show. Those okay. are fu- so much fun. Because I don't tell you your future. I think that's crap. I don't think that... I think people who can say, you're going to meet this person in the future and it's going to be XYZ as a charlatan and mm-hmm. run away. They just mm-hmm. want your money. Mm-hmm. I build personality profiles. Interesting. And I'll even gamify it for the skeptics because what I'm doing is I'm reading your body language and I'm reading your worry lines, which is basically what these are. They shift over time. And I'll have you make like a clandestine decision Interesting. that nobody knows, like maybe a playing card that you like you, you spread out and just picked one you viscerally wanted and hide it in your pocket and I'll figure out the decision you made based okay. on Okay. That so okay. that's a lot of fun. Okay. But I tell you what, uh just say stop whenever you like. Stop. Right here. Beautiful. Take this card. Yep. Take a look at it. Normally I say show you around, but there, there's not really anybody to show it to. Okay. Uh, but just make sure you remember it. Uh-huh. And put it back back in the pack for me, please. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now the thing is I've been performing so much that I don't need to resort to sleight of hand to find a card as special as yours, Mr. McKenna. Okay. If that is your real name. I think it is. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> this could have been a stage name kind of thing. Maybe maybe Eric McKenna is your dancer name. I don't know. Shh. <laughs> maybe Eric's your middle name and you grew up on McKenna Avenue. No. Oh. Mm-hmm. I, have, I, have a to- I have a great dancer name, by the way. <laughs> it's Dick Whipple. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. No, you can't. I grew up on Whistle. Until I was seven, I lived on Whipple Street in Swiss Elm Park. Oh, (laughs) my Lord. uh, The point is, I've developed a trained eye for chosen cards like yours. Okay. This one in particular. Okay. This one's a little twitchy. So if I hold these cards up to the light... All right, the camera's over there. If I hold these cards up to the light just right, one card is going to stick out to me. Uh, Being a chosen card, you understand, it's going to give off a slight heavenly aura, like almost a cherubic glow spreading across those angels on the card. You mean like the color? Yeah, I'm not sure if you would have noticed this almost imperceptible discoloration here. But to my trained eye that sticks out, it tells me something wonderful about you. You know what it tells me? It tells me that your card was, oh, I love this, because we're two people trying to affect a positive change in this uh-huh. world. Uh-huh. And that's what spades represent. These represents change. So it tells me that your card was the two. 
of space. Yeah. Right? Yes. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this blue back two of spades is just way too good to be true. Am I right? Just Maybe. Yeah, thank you. Maybe. So to prove to you that it wasn't a coincidence that you picked the only blue two, blue two of spades in the, in, in the pack... Okay. I'm going to tell you something. When you were in the restroom earlier, I was just sitting there thinking about the kind of card that you might be attracted to. All right. So I even set aside here in my pocket the red two of space. <laughs> <laughs> Warlock. <laughs> no, that's, that's my favorite part of the whole thing. So <laughs> here's what we're going to do. Normally I'd have you stand on oh, it or something right. like yeah, that, yeah. but you're way over there, so... Who's this buddy who's singing over here? It's little Johnny Rotten over here. Oh, oh, perfect. Johnny. I'm not fucking with Johnny. So put, yeah, nobody Johnny fucks Card, with Johnny. Have Johnny Card the two of space. Put him on top of there. Uh, Johnny on top of here? Yeah, exactly. Have him dance on there. Sing on that all night. Nobody all messes right. with that. That's right. Okay. Now, uh, once more, just say stop whenever you like. Uh, stop. Right there? Mm hmm Beautiful. Take your card. Take a look at it. Show it around. Oh, I, I, see, I'm used to performing for a bunch of people. Uh, now, are you happy with that card, or do you want a different one? It's fine. I want to make this clear. It's fine. Because everybody always asks me after this. They are all different. They are not all two of spades, okay? Okay. Yeah, I'm so happy. What I, okay, I'd just like to make sure that yes means yes. Yes, I am um, happy. All right. Uh, in that case, show me that card. Oh, I like it. The Ace of Diamonds. Okay, you could have had any card you wanted in the pack. Right. That's the one. But I tell you what, for two shining stars, let me see what I can do. Ace of diamonds? No, no, no. What? Ace of diamonds. Oh, get out of here. Ain't no way. There's no, there's no way. There's no <laughs> Warlock. <laughs> it's great when it works. John, it's your fault. I'll take that back because I hate when I'm not playing with, I mean, I'm not playing with a full, full deck. deck. But, but, Actually, this one is missing a jack of diamonds. Somebody signed it the other night, and I grabbed the wrong. I, I forgot to put one, a new one back. I have boxes full of extra cards to replenish decks. Uh, so, so this is an example of what I would consider magic performance okay. art. Okay. 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 I mean, there's a little because I can't help myself. There's a little bit of mentalism mixed in where I said where, where, where I set aside a card and I made a prediction and kind of influenced you right. and, and, and right. this with your perception. Sure, a bit. sure, sure. But primarily, the, these were magical effects. Okay. And know there was some sleight of hand involved in all that right uh -huh. so 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 that's that's an example of uh, of a performance piece uh which is actually my take on a classic piece right because like because mag magic and mentalism everything like that it's it, there's a lot of foundations for jazz in okay it, where people think about the methods and they build on things and have their own innovations so there's some subtle innovations there that actually are all my own but anyway so take these and give them a little mix for me please oh i used to know how to shuffle so. yeah. I'm pretty bad at this, so. Oh, that's quite all right. If if they are in a different order and not on the floor, it is a good shuffle. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a card player. There. That's okay. I shuffled enough. Thanks. And by the way, uh, I always pay my assistants, so here you go. Look at that. One million dollar note. Those are the best business cards you've ever seen. Yeah, you aren't kidding. That's good. I know. People don't throw those out. I made I made a ton of these specials That's for... That's really good. That's really good. Zoom in on that. That is good. I like that. You know, the problem is all these people in my industry are going to watch this and they're going to steal everything. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I digress. The point is, you shuffled these cards. Uh -huh. Now, you are aware, because you're an excellent musician... That mm, I used to be. <laughs> yeah, I used to be too. But I don't get a chance to practice anymore because I have to practice other things. Sure. But you're you're a musician. I am. And you have an ear, a good ear. I hope. So, and it, but the everybody and we've talked about this before we started the cameras. Mm -hmm. People have unique styles. Yes. They have unique way, forms of self-expression. So you can tell. Sometimes with one note what guitar player saxophonist is playing mm -hmm. because they have that finely tuned their sense of self-expression mm -hmm. but it doesn't take that skill level to express yourself okay because everybody signals self-expression in all sorts of subtle ways that's why we were talking about body language reading and um you know reading stress lines and right. palms and things right so for example everybody has a unique form of handwriting okay so if you study this, it's a field called graphology. 
in or handwriting for f- forensics where they actually solve crimes with it and right figure things out right where they can tell things about people based on the way they dot their eyes or okay. about you eric based on the way you slant certain lists i can't because i can't memorize anything for shit okay and uh, i'm so glad i'm allowed to curse on this thing i never get the curse Fuck right you can <laughs> I, I never get to, i'm super clean when i perform so i never right. get the curse right we're not we're, we're a little, like a little irreverent here at yeah. times well, that's, that's, that's how I describe myself, irreverent benevolence. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, people say, what's your character, what's your performance style? That's what I do. But the point is, you have a unique way that you handled these cards. Mm-hmm. Because your fingers manipulated them in a subtle way, just like they would a pen. Okay. Where your personality comes out. Okay. Now, I've been studying and watching people shuffle cards since I was about uh, yay high or so. And you're from Pittsburgh, so you're aware that yay is a very precise form mm-hmm. of measurement, correct? Extremely precise. Thank you. No, I didn't realize that this is a very Pittsburgh thing. So I was in Seattle performing at an engineering conference. <laughs> they did not get yay at all. I wouldn't think they would. By the end of that networking night, they were so drunk that the, everything was yay, yay this, yay that. They thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I know I knew I had a good note with them because they sent me a review afterwards that said, Seth, your show is yay awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning at coffee, I introduced Yo and threw them off. I was like, you know, it's a double yay. So this is me at five and this is me at ten. What, what don't you understand? <laughs> oh, my God. So, but I digress. The point is, uh, since I've gotten to know you and your personality mm-hmm. a bit and we've been having some jokes and laughs, uh, I'm going to just try to examine your shuffle here and just try to figure out to a limited degree what I think you might choose to do with these cards next. Oh, maybe. No, no. Oh, maybe. It's interesting. Okay. Oh, I just do this until one of us is uncomfortable. I'm just... It's definitely me. Don't worry. (laughs) I'm fine. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to write it down so that way I am committed. I mean, I should have been committed a long time ago, giving up a career as a project manager to do this, but I'm committed to this decision. Okay. The point is, it's really written here. I just don't want you to read it yet, because I don't want to influence your decision. Okay. Otherwise, we'll be here influencing each other all night. All right. So, as I spread through these cards, I'm going to come around and talk to you. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, as I spread through the cards here... Mm Mm-hmm. Just slip this between any two cards you like, just like that. But don't let me influence your decision. All right. Anywhere you like, just stick it in. In the deck, I mean, please. Ugh. You giggle, but some lady chased me around for three minutes. <laughs> oh, my God. I hope not. Let me put it this way. We never recovered the prediction. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. All right. But are you happy with this decision? Yeah. Are you sure? Because you can see I'm committed. Okay. Like I said, I like to make sure that yes me. So this is the spot you like? Yeah. Okay. Now, you could have put it anywhere you liked. Yeah. But you were attracted to this one spot here in the pack. Could have changed your mind. But I had a feeling from getting to know you, (laughs) because you are such a knave who is bent on changing the world because of the love in your heart and bringing all these beautiful guests on in order to affect a positive, beautiful change Uh in the world, Uh that this is the spot, that knave of change and this love that you Uh would be attracted to. Uh Uh-huh. Directly between the Jack of Spades and the Two of Hearts. Unbelievable. <laughs> Warlock. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. I don't know how it's possible. I don't know how it's possible. That's good. That's really good. Thank you. That's for you, by the way. Thank you. I'm going to keep this, yeah. That's a good photo of you. Oh, thank you. I paid a lot for it. I bet. I think Rich Fellini. Yeah, I don't know how you would do that. That doesn't... I don't, I don't know how... I. I and I love that stuff because it really, you know, it really is uh, challenging to the mind. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's about studying you. And you know, if you changed your mind, I would have been screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. Sometimes, sometimes I know people are definitely good people who change their mind, and I, you know, I get them to do it. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much for changing your mind. It's one of those things where it's, um, you know, like if I, like you could, people play these games where they say, point to an object in the room, and. Uh, and let me write down what I think you're thinking. Like you've ever played that game when you were a kid? Uh-uh. Oh, I, I've known. I played that game. Lots of people. Have, okay. So, uh, you know, or think of an object, or whatever. Like it's a twenty questions kind of a game. And so you narrow it down. Yeah, you know, like like if you asked me to think of an object in the room, I'd be thinking of uh, of, of, of of the kiss bobblehead over there. Personally. Okay. But that, that's okay. the thing that's gonna that, that's gonna focus on me. All right. Uh, so you can play those games, and if you get good at it, you can be like you can always nail people to a 
good percentage. I Got strive it. for about 85% accuracy. This is what I was talking about with one of the differences between mentalism and magic. Obviously, I'm showing something different. With the magic, I'm right. showing just something impossible. Right, right, the right. mentalism, I'm showing something that is possible, but it takes a very highly to honed Got mind it. to put that out. And I'm talking about something beautiful in you okay. and how you're special. Got and it. how what you're doing is something beautiful. And that's why you were attracted to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And because that's my bent. I don't want to be like, think of a word. Oh, it's Bobby. <laughs> Aren't I great? <laughs> Who cares? I care about you. I want you to, I want you to walk away feeling good, not me. Got it. All right. And, and that's why like, I, I, I encounter so many people because so many bad comedy magicians who are bad at both think they're Don Rickles and they get people up and they abuse <laughs> them. Rickles. Yeah. It, it, and they get people up and they abuse them and they're uh, like oh i don't know yeah. about this you know yeah yeah so th th that that's that that's my performance style but the difference as you can see is one is just like this is this weird impossible thing that happened and the other is there's something intriguing about that can you tell me more about my life and about everything else okay and also with magic, unless I screw it up because I drop my cards, or you know, or or, or 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 I'm a little sloppy, like with the ring where I hit the, this, you know, okay, okay. Uh, you know, it's going to work. Got it. Because it's designed that way. Got it. With mentalism, there's hazard. I strive for about eighty-five to ninety percent yeah, success. Yeah, yeah. There's no guarantee that it's going to. That's the thing. Like work. I take a risk. If we're doing one thing, this might not work. Okay. Or sometimes I'm like one or two off. Or I get the jokers that like try to put it between the top two or the bottom two, and you can usually identify them if you accidentally <laughs> pick them. And I'm not sure, and I'm never sure if they're the top or bottom, which that it's sounds 50, dirty, 50. but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I'm usually, yeah. So, but I can usually identify who those people are, or like the people who are like one down. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but otherwise, it gets interesting because now I'm saying this is a microscopic scale of me saying point to an object of the room. Mm -hmm. uh, but also based on your personality and how you handled these. So I'm watching this and watching your hand movements. Interesting. Trying to predict what you might want to do. Okay. So that, that, that's kind of the idea behind that piece. Okay. But we talked about other things where it's building personality profiles or right. psychology. Right. You know, I, many people have called me psychic. I don't think I'm psychic. Okay. I've tried to convince every girl I've ever dated I don't <laughs> think I'm psychic. So I appreciate like, that. And how can they reach you, my friend? All oh. the ways they can reach you. Well, my name is hard to pronounce, but it's Seth Newstein. No, it's not hard to pronounce. I mean, it's hard to spell, I mean. See, I'm tired, <laughs> too. Uh, so it's N is in Nancy, E-U-S-T-E-I-N is in Nancy is my mm -hmm. name. Uh, so you can go to SethNewstein.com. Please go to my Facebook page yes. and like it. Connect with connect Follow with me on, on Instagram Facebook. because I'm terrible at Instagram, but I try so hard. <laughs> uh, I'm mediocre at Facebook. I could use some more likes, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but those are the best three best ways to find me. Obviously, you can email me, magic at sethnewstein.com. Mm -hmm. If you look up my name, it's a unique Just name. Just Google him. Yeah, right. You'll, you'll, you'll find, find everything you need. It's not like my name is John Smith. You'll find me real easy. <laughs> I appreciate it, buddy. No, I appreciate you. And until next time, for sure? Absolutely. All right. All right, friends. We are out. Woo! That was good. That was fun. That was not only fun. Fairy tips above the water. You watch me drown. You could have saved me, but you let me down. Yeah.